Ladies and gentlemen, after a bit of a hiatus, it is both an honor and a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. We're, we're trying to get canceled at some point throughout this conversation, but yeah, use the term men sparingly, you yeah. bigot. I can't put myself in God's shoes. Um, on the same token, if we're, if we're his children, I just I don't understand how you can create uh, a, a planet filled with you know almost 8 billion people that many of whom uh, largely do really, really fucking terrible things to one another. If you don't think there's a spiritual realm, if you think we're matter, right? Everything's just matter, right? We're stardust bumping into other stardust. Then you're gonna push back darkness, maybe that's philosophical, right? You're gonna push back against critical race theory. You're gonna push back against Marxism. From my standpoint, you know, again, I just look at it, you know, I try to look at it logically and thinking is that what kind of fucking twisted plan is that? Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. Ladies and gentlemen, after a bit of a hiatus, here we are in the new studio. It is both an honor and a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. He is the founder of Undaunted Life, which is a badass organization that equips men to push back darkness. We're going to get into the exclusivity of men here in just a bit uh, and try to get canceled in the process. He is the host of Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. He uh, is the Angry Ginger Orchard founder, and ladies and gentlemen, the carpet does match the curtains. I saw him change early after the bite work scene. Welcome to the stage, Kyle Thompson. Appreciate it, man. Thanks for letting me be here. Uh, thanks for coming. I know uh, it was a bit of a bit of a journey in the fucking rain, which, uh, you know, if uh, April showers brings May flowers, this ought to be a fucking bouquet yeah, in should, Texas. Yeah, it should be now. good. I'd like to take a quick second uh, to shout out and thank our sponsor for today's podcast, Origin Labs and Jocko Fuel. Jocko Fuel is a great product. Uh, he's got a ton of products actually within the Jocko Fuel line. Uh, the guests and I enjoy them on the show. And outside, I take a lot of the supplements. Uh, I've got some of the Origin Lab jeans, uh, boots, geese, and uh, it's just an all around American industry. Uh, they do a fantastic job really re revolutionizing American industry from start to finish. It's all American made, uh, all American sourced. Everything start to finish is made right there in house. And they really do a phenomenal job creating the products and fulfilling the whole ball of wax. They've been a huge supporter of the Mic Drop podcast for a while now. And I really can't thank Jocko Fuel and Origin Labs enough for the job that they do for us. And so thank you to you guys. I'd also like to talk about uh, my brand of dog food that just came out. There's uh, food, treats, uh, a line of supplements. The supplements are hip and joint, digestive, skin and coat. Uh, the treats, there's salmon bites, beef bites, turkey bites, uh, salmon skins. And then the food, we've got a, uh, a chicken and sweet potato formula as well as a salmon and herring meal formula. All of these products I, I've come out with uh, in the last six months after years of, of trying to find uh, kind of the right blend and, and be uncompromising in the product quality of what I want uh, and was uh, fortunate enough to work with a manufacturer that made everything exactly how I wanted it, uh, tested it out and got it dialed into exactly how I want it. And now we've brought it to market and, uh, and it's available to you guys. So MikeRitlandCo.com, it's the fueled by team dog line of, of food treats and supplements. I encourage you to either check it out or choke yourself. We just did a bite scenario where uh, you've never been in a bite suit and we got uh, my new, newer personal dog who's uh, still a young buck. He just turned two. He's not quite finished training wise. But uh, we, we let you be the punching bag uh, for his uh, uh, flossing uh, of, of today. What, uh, what did you think of it? I mean, that to say it went as expected and didn't go as expected would probably be the right way of saying it because yeah. it's like if you've never been attacked by a dog before in a controlled environment or a non-controlled environment, like you don't exactly know what to expect. You've, I feel like you did a pretty good job of like saying, okay, like, you know, you can give him your forearm or you can give him the bicep. He's not going to go off at your face because, I mean, in a bite suit, it's like, okay, there's no helmet. Like yeah. there's no like there's face no shield or something like that. There's yeah. no gloves, like special chain mail gloves or something like that. But, you know, 
it was just crazy to feel the power of that animal because yeah. you're dealing with the power of the jaw and the entire body at the same time. Whereas like, you know, with jujitsu or, you know, something like that, you're feeling the power of whatever, whatever they're trying to do yeah. to you, like the, the hold or, or yeah. the move or the pressure, like that's what you're feeling. But you had to deal with so many different parts of, of the pressure. And then yeah. like, it's, you know, you had me shift positions a few times and all that, but like, yeah, like that's something that, you know, we'll talk about a bucket list thing. That wasn't on my bucket list until like two days ago, whenever I was texting with you about, yeah. you know, firming up the interview. And it's like, Hey, can we do that? Is that like, can I legally like throw this yeah. suit on and get yeah. after it? But yeah, that, that was a yeah. cool experience. No, I, I mean, I appreciate you doing it. I mean, we've had a lot of people that, uh, like, you know, after the podcast, like, Oh, that'd be cool. Or like, well, we can go do it. No, nah, I'm, I'm good. You know, it's like <laughs> mo most people don't want to fucking jump in the bite suit, you know? So, uh, it's neat that you did it. It's also one of those things now that you've experienced it, if there's one thing that I come across more often than, than probably everything else is that, you know, people's inability to, to truly understand how capable they are until you've felt it. Like you can right. try to explain it. You're going to feel a lot of pressure and pinching. It's like, yeah, okay, I got it. And then they put the suit on and like, dude, this thing weighs 40 pounds. It's mm -hmm. like 40 fucking sweatshirts thick. Like I'm not even going to feel it. And then, and then the dog grabs you and you're like, holy fucking shit. Like, and then you, you immediately think, and you even commented on it afterwards. Like, I can't imagine not having this suit on and them biting you like that. Like right. they, they would ruin you and, and they do, um, you know, so it's neat to, it's neat to see that, you know, what you think it's going to be. And then, and yeah. then afterwards, and that's when people, you know, every time they always get it like, yeah, you can't really explain that to somebody, you know? Well, it's it. Cause it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of busted up. I'm bruised a little bit, but I guess part of it as well is, you know, I didn't grow up and I, I didn't get in any fights growing up, right? Like either the opportunity didn't present itself or I actively like went away from the opportunity, right? Yeah. And to a certain degree, you feel like you're made of glass until you realize you're not, right? Yeah. So the first time you get punched in the face where the other person has, you know, malice intent, yeah. you realize, oh, I didn't just break into a million pieces. I'm going to survive this. Yeah. And it's kind of the same thing. Like when you train jujitsu, I mean, this summer is four years of jujitsu training for me. It's like, and I've lost probably a year with injuries, right? So you, yeah. you get a busted up nose. I, like I got scratches on my face. You get like, you get beat up, but it's just like, <clears throat> you look dumb, but it's like, you're, you're going to heal. You're going to be just fine. And so that's yeah. kind of one of the same things with this to where it's yeah. like, that was not a comfortable experience. It's not yeah. something that I would necessarily sign up to do every single day, like yeah. forever. But like, yeah, like experience it, realize you're not made of glass and realize that whoever yeah. made that bite suit yeah. is your new best friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's the damn truth. Uh, for the listeners also, uh, we just launched our, uh, our Patreon page, which to watch the video of Kyle getting the, the shit bit out of him uh, and some of the, the before and after scenes uh, of the interview and in the studio and stuff, that's only available on Patreon. So uh, our, our good producer, Zach, here will uh, interject with, uh, with where, where to, uh, to sign up on Patreon in the, in the description and all that shit below. But uh, Zach, do you have a, a quick, the, uh, the actual fucking address? Uh, yeah, it's patreon.com slash mic drop. Uh, the show, of course, will and always remain free. It is and will always remain free, but uh, for the extra stuff, for, for the new studio stuff, for the dog bread stuff, there's only one place you can go, Patreon. But maybe we'll, maybe we'll share a clip of it somewhere. Maybe you can see yeah. a, little, a little piece of it. Yeah, a little you know? a yeah, teaser, a little teaser clip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's it. Yeah. Yeah. There, there will be a bunch of shit on Patreon coming down the pipe, so uh, go in there, sign up for it, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of good shit coming. So at any rate, uh, here we are. How, uh, how was the trip down? It wasn't bad. I got some family in uh, southern Oklahoma, so it's always good to come down to Texas. So I'm not one of those Oklahomans that are, like, really, really bothered anytime someone mentions Texas. Yeah. Texas is, like, a bigger, sexier Oklahoma, so I get it. Yeah. I don't mind coming down. It, uh, it, it for sure, there, I mean, not only is there the, uh, the Red River, River rivalry that uh, exists football-wise, but Jesus Christ, like, I've never seen two states that, uh, that are so goddamn competitive the way they are, Texas and Oklahoma, but... Um, Oklahoma is a strange, uh, strange state. What is it? Your family or your wife's family? So it's my wife's family. Like I'm from Southwest Oklahoma. I'm from Lawton originally. So Lawton Fort Sills, what a lot of your listeners would probably have heard of, but yeah, yeah they're from Marietta. So about 15 miles North of the, uh, Oklahoma, Texas border. Like it's so close to the border. They would sometimes drive to Texas to like go shopping yeah. or get groceries. Yeah. So they were, they were basically right on the line. And make it back to the casino by dinner. That's right. Yeah. That that's exactly what it is. <laughs> exactly. Uh, that's awesome. What's your, uh, what's your favorite eighties hair band? Ooh, okay. The first one I thought of was Striper that because right? that was like the first one that you could listen to if you were a church kid, right? right? Like, so if you grew up in church and you weren't allowed to listen to all those other ones, but if I'm going to listen to one for real, like it's really hard to not, not like Guns N' Roses, yeah. right? So yeah. like you could, you could consider Metallica, 
hair because of all the hair they had at the time, but they're they're yeah. a straight up metal band, thrash yeah. band, or whatever. But yeah, Guns N' Roses is probably yeah. be my favorite. Fucking a, can't argue with that one. Uh, what's your best Bra- Brazilian jiu-jitsu move? My best move. I'll tell you what what I have hidden a lot lately, right? So because <clears throat> we were talking off air, I like doing a lot of takedowns or whatever. But I'll get to kind of the gift wrap position and then go to arm bar. And so mm-hmm. like I'll gift wrap. Basically, from side control, I kind of force them up, do knee on belly from the side. And then the reason why I like it is because a lot of times when I try to throw up these terrible arm bars because I'm just a yeah. blue belt, I'll, there's a lot of gaps in there, and then the guy ends up getting loose. But when you throw it from the gift wrap position, like you can slowly bring your leg around, and they know yeah. it's coming. Yeah. But, I mean, their arms so, just super trapped, so that's what I like to hit. It's the, uh, it's the anticipation you like to, to butt fuck them with. Well, it's like when I just mentioned Metallica, it's like, you know, creeping death. There are guys at my gym that that's what it feels like when you roll with them because it's like, you know, what's coming and there's just nothing you can do to stop it. Yeah, That's awesome. Yeah. It sounds like something in the bedroom too, huh? I'll I'll just leave that alone. You know, my (laughs) wife dropped us off here. She's going to listen to this later. We'll just kind of move on from there. What, uh, what's the must have fashion item for this year? (laughs) <laughs> what the heck? Uh, yeah, there's this lip balm I've really been enjoying uh, yeah. lately. Yeah, I have good. no, I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, I will say I'm wearing some 511 shorts right. that are nice. They got some pockets that yeah. every time I put them on, I discover a new pop- pocket. So go nuts, get some 511 shorts, guys. Yeah, let, let the nuts breathe. A little yeah, bit. there you go. Uh, what's the fa- favorite book that you've ever read? Uh, Fearless by yeah. Eric Blim. Um, that book is Adam Brown story. Yeah, the Adam Brown story because. You know, with Undaunted Life, we talk about spiritual, mental, and physical resilience and cultivating that on a daily basis. And I've never had a book that has captured kind of the military story, the come from behind underdog type story, you know, the the patriotic story, like kind of all wrapped up into one. And, you know, that's the easiest question in the world for me to answer. Like we have a book list on our website. It's the hundred books every modern Christian man should read list. And that one is highlighted and underlined. And I, you know, I notate it as my favorite book. And, yeah. you know, it's not the only book you should read, but if you're a man listening to this and you haven't read it yet, you have to. Yeah. Uh, one of the questions I like to ask everybody, um, because I just think it says so much about a person. Uh, what is your daily routine uh, or your morning routine? Uh, day to day on, on a normal day where you're not traveling. Yeah. Normal day. Um, I like to wake up early. We've, you know, we've got a young kid and so that's kind of messed up some, some nights and some mornings and all that trying to get used to him. He just, uh, turned one years old, not long ago, but I like to wake up and lift first thing. Um, because you know, a lot of guys, they'll get into the habit of letting their day dictate to them what it's going to do as opposed to them dictating to their day, what they're going to do. Yeah. And so like the very first thing I, I like to do is get in the gym, which is conveniently in my garage. So super, no excuses. I can roll out of bed right into the gym. I like to lift, like to get that taken care of, um, you know, help kind of get the kid out the door, do whatever that looks like. And then, you know, it could be reading, you know, Bible study, prepping the podcast. Like there's a lot of things that I like to do, but it's like, if I, if I get through the morning and I haven't lifted, it's a problem. And a lot of times I'll do like the 11 AM jujitsu class at, at my school. And so it's like, before I've eaten lunch that day, because I don't eat until until noon anyway, before I've done anything, like I've lifted and I've gotten in, you know, three, four rolls and some drilling. So that that's a normal morning and that's when I feel super productive. Do you, I mean, how old are you? I'm 34. Do you find that uh, lifting and, and doing that all first thing in the morning, there's no, no joint issues or uh, anything like that? You know, not yet. And the thing is, is like, I'm ripe as someone that's whose body is going to fall apart from overuse. Like that's just something that's, that's going to happen because of my, you know, athletic background and the stuff that I've chosen for hobbies as an adult. But, um, I do listen to my body, but sometimes I tell my body to shut up. Right. Cause some people are like, Oh, I'm listening to my body. So I'm not going to do anything for the next six months. It's like, no, no, no. It's like, is it only effeminate people? that listen? You know, you know, (laughs) can we wait maybe an hour or two before we get canceled? So no, like, but the thing about it is, is like, if you have to do an extra warm up set to feel better for what you're about to do, then do it. Because if you're doing deadlift and squat and front squat, like back squat, front squat, if you're doing bench press, any overhead stuff, yeah. as you get older, you're going to have to take more time to warm up, for more sure. time to cool off, more time to stretch. And so yeah. for me, like I just pay attention to where I'm at. And if I need to peel off a little bit, that's fine. But yeah. I do six week lifting cycles and then I take a week off. And by week off, I mean, I just do jujitsu and yeah. run and stuff like that and stretch. Yeah. And I just don't lift heavy, but yeah, it's just, your body's used to it. Your body will yeah. become inoculated to those hard times. Yeah, I mean, I know for me, like, uh, back when I was your age, yeah. uh, you know, yeah, similarly, like, I was just much more resilient that way. I know for me, I, I noticed it, you know, right right at about 40, and I don't think, I wasn't one of those guys that has the preconceived, like, oh, it's, you know, 40's old, and it's, you know, over yep. the hill, and it's all downhill from there or whatever. But, but for sure, uh, as I hit 40 and now being a few years past it, 
uh, th- that's when I've noticed it, it just, it's harder to, to recover. It's harder to do things first thing in the morning. Uh, as far as heavy shit, I mean, normal day to day shit, it's not, but, um, yeah, for, for me, like I notice recovery takes longer. Um, you know, injuries are, they happen easier. They happen almost yeah. out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. Like think like I'll just wake up and I'm like, why the fuck does this hurt? Right. Like it didn't hurt when I went to bed, you know, and, uh, and, and just things like that. And, and, you know, minor injuries like tendons and, and uh, soft tissue stuff. God damn, it takes forever for it to heal. But well, part of the thing, Mike, like a lot of times when I do the evening classes in jujitsu, yeah. so that might be two, two and a half hours of like hard rounds <coughs> and stuff like that. Part of the thing that I try to make sure that I do is no matter how I feel the next morning, I still lift. Yeah. Right. Because part of that's like, okay, my body doesn't feel good. I'm beat up. I could use that extra hour or two of recovery sleep, but you're, you're callousing the brain a little bit to be like, you're doing this, right? Yeah. You got your shoes on, like you, you throw your belt on, like you're, you're in the gym now. Like, so put whatever podcast on you need to put on, put whatever book, whatever music, but just like wake up with that kind of get after it mindset. And like most of the other things will fall into place. And when you talk to most people that don't want to work out early in the morning, which is everyone except for Jocko Willink, like w- whenever you wake up and get it done, you're not disappointed at 6.30 when you're done. Yeah. Like you're, you've done the hardest thing you could possibly do that day yeah. and it's before breakfast. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, for for me, like I said, it it, uh, it it used to absolutely be that way. Now I like there there's certainly t- days, and, and I would say most days, you know, where I wake up, I'm, I'm just like I'm not fucking, I'm not doing it yeah. this morning. You know, I'm not, I don't do it most mornings. Like I'll I'll usually wait until about uh, eleven eleven thirty mm-hmm. before I actually lift. Uh, you know, si- similarly, like I'm fortunate enough to to have a garage gym, and and schedule wise, I, I essentially work from home, so I. I can really do it whenever I want, and and I've bumped it back to where it's it's late morning before mm-hmm. I'll actually do it because it just I find it for me at least uh, it's just counterproductive. Like I, I don't get the quality of workout in uh, at fucking five that I do at at eleven or yeah. or even later. I mean sometimes I'll work out in the afternoon, which this time of year fucking sucks. Like it's it's a way worse workout in terms of conditions. At, at three in the afternoon when it's 110 mm-hmm. fucking degrees in the garage. But, uh, but it, it's still for me, it just, uh, it's, it's more conducive body wise, at least, at least for me. But, um, in terms of your upbringing, I'm curious, uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, born and raised in Oklahoma. Can you tell me a little bit about, uh, what, what the kind of the overall, um, just feeling of, of what, what it was like growing up at that time in, in that area and, and what that looks like? Yeah. So the, Unique thing about about my upbringing is growing up in Lawton, that's not a town that most people know about unless they know about Fort Sill because at the time, and it may still be, it was the largest artillery base in the United States Army in the U.S. Um, so one thing that I didn't really realize about my upbringing was how diverse of an upbringing I had. So the things that were just normal to me were just normal until I got to college and I ran into people that were like, you know, they grew up in a town where there, there were no people that didn't look like them, Right. Um, and I, my mom sent me a picture of my sixth grade class picture. Cause I ruined the class picture. I like made this stupid face. I had this dumb haircut. I was fat. And like, I made this dumb <laughs> face and like one kid flipped off the camera and they could like mark his finger out. Yeah. They couldn't mark my face out. Right. And yeah. so it's like, Oh, I forgot I'd done that. But then I started looking at my class and over 50% of the class was not white. Yeah. And, you know, this is in Oklahoma where everyone thinks we're white people on covered wagons and, you know, yeah. you know, we're screwing with, the, the Indri- yeah, screwing with the Indians and teepees and all that. But it was an incredibly diverse upbringing because of the types of friends that I had. And I tell people all the time, it's like, I had been offered by gangbangers, Kyle, if you ever need us to fight for you, like, you're our people, like, you just let us know. Like, legit Hoovers and, and Crips and, like, they, they, were, they were not kidding when they said that. But then I had just as many rednecks like, hey, Kyle, if you ever get stuck in ditch or you need to build a fence, like, you know, it's all it's all those types of things was kind of wrapped up in my childhood. And so, you know, at the time it was the third or fourth largest city in Oklahoma. So it felt like a city, but it still kind of felt like a town, yeah. right? You had your section of town, you had your people that you rolled with and there was the drag and then there was the restaurants that you could only go to in Lawton and that kind of thing. Yeah. And so looking back, a lot of people try to get out of Lawton, right? You know, oh, it's ghetto and oh, it's this and oh, it's that. And like, I understand that, but it's like, that that's where I was forged, right? Yeah. The first 18 years of my life, that's, that's where I spent it. What's the uh, ballpark population there? When I was living there as a teenager, I want to say it was maybe like 70,000. I might be yeah. off on that, but like, again, it was like Oklahoma city, Tulsa. And then there was like one suburb and then Lawton or Lawton was third or fourth. And that's basically yeah. what it was like. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm assuming the, the 
most of the diversity comes from the base being there and, and kids. Yeah, the from, base you know. in Goodyear. And so, like, my dad works uh, – he still works at Goodyear, and he's been there for over 40 years. And so you've got a lot of guys that kind of move from the surrounding areas into Lawton because of that. Yeah. But, yeah, it's it's mainly because of Fort Sill. So you have the transient population. They're just going to be there for a few years or something like that. But yeah. that's where a lot of the diversity comes from as well. Yeah. Did you find uh, any resistance to that growing up in terms of some of the local population? Like, or was everybody just kind of used to it? I mean, both, yeah. right? So it's like you wake up and some of the things that people say, those that was normal as well. Like, yeah. you know, some of the stereotyping and some of the stuff that kind of goes on. And, you know, that's those are other things that you don't really realize that you were living through until you hear other people kind of talk about their upbringing. It's like, okay, they weren't really around yeah. people that said stuff like that. Yeah. But I guess the other part of it was, is like, it was not uncommon to see like a mixed race couple or like, you know, a couple with a large age disparity or like all that was just, pretty, pretty much normal. Yeah. And so now I don't, I can't speak for like my dad's generation or my granddad's generation and kind of what it was like, but I mean, did they grow up there as well? Yeah. yeah. I mean, basically everyone in my family grew up there and it was like the kids, like my cousins, we were all the ones that moved, right? Okay. Everybody else pretty much, pretty much stayed the entire time, which, yeah. you know, convenient for Thanksgiving and Christmas being able to roll home and, you know, see everybody. But, yeah. um, you know, it's kind of one of those deals where, when you move away to go to college and then you like the town you end up in and then you kind of put roots down there. Whereas a lot of our parents maybe didn't do the college thing and you know, they just kind of stayed in Lawton because that's what they wanted to do. Yeah. Uh, siblings. Yep. So I have one older sister and so she lives in the city I'm in now. Oh, how much older? Yeah. She's uh 14 months older. So, oh, okay. you know, my parents, they always kind of joke like when we were done with diapers, we were done with diapers and then, yeah. you know, you kind of move on and go from there. And she's had a couple of kids. So I have a niece and a nephew on that side. So it's pretty cool. Were there any of the, uh, the hot sisters, friends, fucking in high school, kind of, uh, no. none of that. Yeah. And I'm, I don't feel bad about saying this cause I know my sister will never listen to this podcast, <laughs> but like, um, she was, uh, I'll put it as nicely as I know how to put it. She, she and I got the same grades in school, but we went about it completely differently. So she was front of the class, you know, glasses, never going to say a word, always going to do what the teacher expects. I was back of the class trying to get everyone to laugh. Like, so when I got in trouble, it was dumb, like trying to be dumb trouble, not like, you know, knocking over a liquor store trouble. And so like a lot of her friends were more so like they were in the band and, you know, they read <laughs> babysitters club and stuff like that. So, uh, did not have the experience of having to deal with that growing up at all. None of that, huh? No, That's no. I mean, it's mess. probably a good thing. Probably yeah. a good thing to kind of keep uh, keep everything on the straight and narrow. But yeah, there was definitely. Well, I think it temptation. sucks because I think the the coolest <laughs> thing about having an older sister would be her hot friends. But uh, but well, did you have an older sister? I, like, did oh, no, I didn't. Okay, so see, I, you I, yeah. I had two older brothers. I had a younger sister. She was uh, she's three years younger than I am. So yeah, there was no no benefit to that. Um, <laughs> sports. I, you know, I I see the cauliflower here. I'm assuming you were a wrestler, especially being from Oklahoma. I'm from Iowa, which you know wrestling is fucking god there. So. Is that, is that, uh, was that the gist of the, the upbringing? Yeah. So funny thing about that. Uh, I wrestled just in ninth and 10th grade. I was baseball all the way through. Really? So a little bit of football here, you know, but I, I played pickup basketball, but like in terms of sports that I just played and that was my sport, it was baseball. And so wrestling was more to like kind of stay in shape. Yeah. But the thing that was interesting is I never enjoyed baseball practice, Yeah. right? Because, you know, baseball is a tremendously difficult sport. It's a skill sport. Like, it's not everyone's cup of tea. It's my cup of tea. I love it. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm the guy that goes crazy on opening day and trying to invite everybody over the house to come watch baseball or whatever. But I remember at the end of baseball practice, you know, the kids and my teammates and I, we would all complain if we had to run foul poles, right? From foul pole to foul pole, back and forth like five times, right? Oh, it's terrible. Where are they? They're trying to kill us. But then wrestling practice, like they're trying to kill you, right? Yeah. Like literally. And like you, you would have sweat just falling off your face and like that. I always enjoyed wrestling practice because you knew you had accomplished something. But the the cauliflower, that came that came from jujitsu. Oh, sure. Like none of it came from wrestling at all. But like my first month in a gi and my white belt and all my terrible skill sets, ears blew up and it's just kind of like that. that's how it goes. Oh, so. And then I got guys that are like black belts whose ears look perfect. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah. I mean, so many kids in uh, in Iowa, at least from from when I was growing up, had had it. You know, from from wrestling, it's just such a big deal there. But I know Oklahoma uh, historically has has a pretty rough uh, or a tough program. Oklahoma State, anyway. Their you know, yeah. the wrestling is, is really good. But um, <clears throat> during that that upbringing, um, was there a a huge or heavy emphasis uh, influence on religion? Is that is that something that you grew up with uh, that plays uh, a big role now, or was there any uh, contrast there? 
there was no bring, upbringing with religion at all. There was no church going for the most part. And so c- kind of the thing is, is like when you grow up and you're born in Oklahoma, right? Like you're a Christian by dint of birth, yeah. right? It's like, oh, you were born here. You're, you're in the belt buckle of the Bible belt. So you're, you're a Christian, right? Yeah. Like you believe in God. And so there was a belief in God, but there was no like gospel understanding. There was no, you know, covering ourselves in the scriptures or anything. Like the Bible was something that sat in the foyer. And, you know, once a year we'd, you know, blow the dust off and like throw it open and pretend like we gave a crap. Right. Um, and like when I was in sixth grade, my mom started taking us without my dad to like this local church of Christ. Cause that's kind of how she grew up. And we, like we hated it. Like we would always hope that mom would sleep in and like that yeah. didn't last very long. Your dad hated it too. That's why he didn't go around. Yeah. There's just never those discussions. Like there were never godly or biblically based discussions anywhere in the household. And so funny, so I didn't have the older sister thing, but I did have the friends who knew the hot girls thing, right? And so around like seventh, eighth grade, my buddies were like, Kyle, you got to come to this youth group. It's like two miles away from your house. All the girls are smoke shows, all of them, right? And I'm like, wait, wait, so y'all go like swimming and stuff too? They're like, oh yeah. And so, you know, being, you know, testosterone filled little kid, you know, that's kind of where I went. And so it kind of started doing the youth group thing and started kind of, you know, learning the Christianese, like how to sound like not a heathen around people that have been in church their whole life. Um, but yeah, as a 10th grader, there was a guest pastor that came in and did the Sunday night sermon, right? It was hellfire and brimstone. We got volcanoes. We got earthquakes. You better get saved or you're going to hell. Like the, the full nine, right? And I was like, oh, crap, I don't want to go to hell. That sounds terrible. Um, volcanoes all the time. That sounds awful. And so at that point, like in Christian parlance, I was saved. Like I was you know, I entered into a discipleship relationship with Jesus Christ. And from then on, it was like just kind of figuring it out on my own, which really is kind of what led to Undaunted Life a lot because it's around the time I'm trying to figure out what it means to be a man, right? You know, 14, 15 years old, I'm also trying to figure out what it means to be a Christian. And what, like, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. And the dichotomy started right then, Mike, where it was like, the men I saw in church that were the godly men, like the the good dudes, you know, the the pastors and the and the elders and stuff like that, these were not men that I would have considered to be manly by any stretch of the imagination. They were pretty doughy, right? You know, they're they're pretty soft. And so as I'm learning to become a man, it's like, okay, I need to learn how to be a man from these people that exist outside the church. And then I'll learn how to be godly from these people inside the church. And so that, that basically stuck with me and kind of gnawed at me for, for years and years and years to come. But in terms of your question, I have no idea where that desire and that thirst for, you know, the, the things of the spiritual realm or the godly realm, I have no idea where that came from because it certainly didn't come from anything overt in my yeah. upbringing. Well, it's interesting because, I mean, it, it's, that's usually the case. I know, like, for me, it, growing up, uh, I wouldn't say that, um, you know, there was this huge overtone of, of religion. On the same token, we were Lutheran, which there's a confirmation process that's, you know, three years of going to, uh, you know, weekly uh, night Bible study and, and going through this whole thing. It's almost like a, a certification process, you know, and, and I did that and and was a pretty staunch Christian for, for a number of years up until, um, you know, after I'd been in the SEAL teams for a few years and had been around the world and, you know, seen a lot of other things, that's that's when my, my perspective, perspective kind of shifted a little bit. But, uh I definitely want to get into that, but I'm curious, um, are, are there any other individuals in your fam- your immediate family now that, that picked that same kind of thirst and, and uh, interest in Christianity the way that you did, or, or are they still kind of the way they were growing up? Yeah, so uh, my Uncle Kevin and my Uncle Dan, like <laughs> my, my, grand- my great-grandparents had kids for a long time, so they're not technically my uncles or like second uncles is kind of how that works out, but I, I still call them my uncles, and they have background, some of them even in vocational ministry, Mm -hmm. but it was kind of one of those deals where every time Christmas or Thanksgiving dinner would roll around, they were the ones that were asked to pray, right? You know, if someone were to pass away, they were the ones that were asked to speak at the funerals and those types of things. And it was, it was kind of interesting for me. There was a point maybe a few years ago where I was starting to be asked to pray. And no matter what happens, because like my grandmother just passed away not that long ago, and I was asked to speak at her funeral, but in my head, I'm not a 30 plus year old man, you know, moving in to try to be a patriarch of my own family, right? I'm still the kid that got kicked out of the kitchen for like sticking his finger in the mashed potatoes. And like, that's kind of where I still am mentally. Um, But those are a couple of guys that I wasn't around often enough to really pick much up. I will say about, about my uncle Kevin, he was very much so the servant 
leader, right? Very much so kind of the lamb of God type style. That man has sacrificed his entire life so that his wife and children could be comfortable so that he could provide for people. He's a doctor and provide, you know, via his business and via his profession and watching him for years and years be the last one to grab a plate, right? Some people have gone back for seconds. He still hasn't gotten his plate. He's making sure everyone's comfortable. He's making sure everybody has what they want to have. He's making sure they're full, you know, taking care of some of the older folks that, you know, maybe need some help eating or need help sitting down or standing up, whatever. He did that over and over and over because I was always the one, like, got to be in the front line. Like, I got to get the best piece of chicken. I got to get the best cut of turkey. And, like, Such and you a know, dick. Yeah, you know, it's like that was me, right, my whole time growing up. But then at some point, it's like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm going to try it this way. And so you kind of like mold into that position to where you're like, no, I'm going to take more of a, not subservient role, but I'm going to be a servant here. Like I'm going to serve these people. And if, you know, if I don't get fed, then, you know, that's just not what's going to happen. Right. I guess from uh, what I'm, I'm curious of is like your sister, your parents, or are they still kind of the way they were growing up or have they adopted more of a Christian lifestyle the, the way that you have? You know, yeah. If, if you're, if I remember correct, you're saying that you, you blew the, the dust off the Bible, like it, it wasn't something you did a lot. Are, are they yeah. still that way or are they more into it the way you are now? I'd say it's still that way. I mean, for my sister, you know, we don't, we don't spend a whole lot of time interacting, but you know, the sense I get is that her and her family, they do go to church and you know, that is part of her life, but she's not very bold about that. For my mom and my dad, I would say there's, there's been no change whatsoever. I mean, to me, that's interesting. It's, it's usually the other way around, you know, where you grow yeah. up a certain way and it kind of fizzles out or, or whatever. But right. Uh, that's an interesting uh, d- dynamic for sure. Is there is there a, an uncomfortability to the relationship with your sister, or is it uh, just you just don't talk that much? So it's not as much uncomfortability. That's a good, that's a good way of framing it. It's a from the age of about five to about twenty, we didn't really have a relationship, <clears throat> right? You know, we we were you know sharing a wall, but we didn't share much else. Yeah. Uh, like no common interests. Um, you know. I think there was a little bit of resentment there because my parent, I played a lot of baseball, a lot of tournaments. And so my sister was drugged to all those, but then I was able to get out and go into her band recitals somehow. Right. Yeah. Which is great for me, but probably not good for the relationship. But you know, you know, I love her and I, and I love my niece and nephew and she's got a great husband and it's, it seems to be a very loving family. We're just kind of two divergent people, right? It's like, you know, you, you run into people that it's like, if they weren't part of your platoon or, or part of your workspace or, or part of your family, you probably wouldn't have a huge in-depth relationship with them anyway. Yeah. But it's kind of one of those deals to where it's just like, you know, there, there's love there. There's just not a whole lot of like closeness or intimacy yeah. kind of a deal. Yeah, no, I'm tracking. Um, all right. So as you're in those formative teenage years and you, you, you get the kind of the, the thought process of wanting to emulate, uh, you know, what you consider, you know, menly man, men, um, or manly men, and, and then also, you know, men of God, and, and kind of blend that into a hybrid. At, at what point did uh, did that form or or direct you into the next phase of life after high school, and what did that look like? I'd really say where the rubber met the road was probably after I graduated from my undergrad, so put me in my early 20s. Where'd you go to college? So I went to the University of Central Oklahoma, so mentioning Oklahoma wrestling, I think Oklahoma State is the gold standard, but UCO is a Division two school, I think 17 uh, wrestling national championships, team national championships, and dozens and dozens of all Americans and, and national champions. And so uh, that's where I went. I got a, a full ride scholarship there on, on a leadership scholarship. My wife actually got it the next year, right? Oh, so that's where we met because we were in this organization together. Um, and so you do the normal college thing, but like, again, I was a like, I wanted to get a 4.0. Like I, I was studying on Friday evening. I wasn't partying. Like I was, I really kept my nose to the grindstone because it's like that scholarship got me out of my hometown. Right. And I told you I already appreciate my hometown, but it's like my scholarship got me out of there and I was going to honor the commitment the university made to me, the tens of thousands of dollar commitment they made yeah. because they saw something in an 18 year old ginger. Right. Um, but where the rubber met the road with in terms of this philosophy of manhood and why it's important and all that was, you know, my wife and I, we got married when we were 22. So we were young and, you know, there was no immediacy in terms of wanting to have children or anything like that. But I could just still sense that no matter what church I went to, no matter what denomination, you know, Lutheran, non-denominational church of Christ or otherwise, there was something that was massively missing with the men. Yeah. It was like this whole in who they were as a person, they either seemed like, you know, emasculated or they seemed like chained up or, or they just weren't there. They were just completely absent because they're like, I'm not doing any of this. Like, these aren't my people, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I'm going to go hang on the golf course. I'm gonna go to the range and, and, you know, shoot or something like that. And so 
that's where it really kind of started to be like, okay, maybe I should like think through this more. Started reading more books that were kind of on biblical manhood and a lot of them missed the mark and some of them, you know, hit the bullseye kind of a deal. But, you know, that, that's kind of where it really started to gnaw at me. Like th- there's an issue here. And at the time, it's like, I didn't think that I would be one of the people that would be in the fight to, to push back against that. But, you know, that's kind of where it really started. The itch started to get a little bit more aggressive. Yeah. So what... Uh what role did that play in college in terms of, uh, I know you did your undergrad and then kind of went into that, but what, what direction did you go both in college, uh, degree wise? And then, and then from there, like how, how did this all kind of come together to, to where it is now essentially? Yeah. So, uh, I went to college not knowing what my major is, which is not something that I would ever suggest anyone do. I know it's hard when you're 17 or 18 and your brain's seven or eight years away from being fully developed to like, I'm going to be an engineer. I'm going to be a this, but it's like, you know, you should go in with some sort of idea, but communications are human resources. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, yeah, funny enough, corporate communication yeah. degree. Um, my university began a leadership minor. So I was actually the first person to complete a minor in leadership studies sure. kind of a deal. That's and so I was kind of the Guinea pig. So I don't, I don't know if they're still, I think they're still doing it, but so in my undergrad, I did more presentations than I took exams. Really? That's kind of how it worked out because they need you to get up and Hey, this is a nine to 11 minute long presentation. If it's under nine minutes, you're dropped a letter grade. If it's over 11 minutes, you're dropped a letter grade. Um, and you need to hit these main points. You need to, you know, kind of crescendo with this. Um, and so you learn how to communicate effectively, but that kind of made you stuck to your notes, right? Because you can't go off on a tangent because then you're going to be under or over. You're going to lose your spot. And so you were kind of dependent on this, this you know, dialogue that you had to create for these presentations. And then I was working at the university after I graduated. And then one of my mentors is like, Kyle, you're an idiot if you don't get your master's because it's going to be paid for because you're an employee. Um, and so I got my MBA. And the MBA was also very presentation heavy, which, which I enjoyed. But as going through my MBA, a lot of my presentation style, because now I'm in the business school, right? They don't care as much about hit these 17 main points and make it sound cool. They want it to be, you know, substantive, right? And so a lot of my presentation skills got a little bit more extemporaneous, like, hey, we're going to kind of figure this out on the fly while knowing in general where we're going to go. And so that's kind of how that formulated, which now works out well whenever I'm podcasting or speaking, kind of having that extemporaneous uh, mindset. Um, and also one thing that I think was good is it didn't pigeonhole me into one thing. So if you go and get your degree in early childhood education and you don't become your, a teacher, you're a moron, yeah. right? If you get a criminal justice degree and then you don't end up going into criminal law or into the police force or something like that, you're dumb, right? Like that's kind of the mindset well, with a communication degree. Yeah. I was, oh, so you can talk, oh, yeah. you know, it's kind of one of those things. And same thing with an MBA. Yeah. It's yeah. like, congrats. You got the same degree as a bunch of idiots. Yeah. I have no idea. Can you think, can you lead, can you problem solve? Like yeah. that's what I need. But you know, to, to be frank, all the way through my twenties, I had as many jobs as I had years out of college. Yeah. Right. You know, I graduated in 2008, right in the middle of kind of, you know, this whole crisis. And so I was taking part-time jobs, labor jobs, just anything to kind of make ends meet kind of a deal. I got down to my last, my last 75 bucks at one point. Like I'm sitting in a house, like, you know, with a space heater on with a blanket over it. Right. Because I couldn't afford to turn the heat on. Um, and so you, you run through and you experience all those things, but you know, I kind of feel like right now I'm hitting my stride with what I was honestly put on this planet by God to do. Mm -hmm. And if I had hit it, you know, hit it big in the insurance business, you know, I had a couple of stints in the insurance business, then that would have been, you know, it would have been a good life, but it's like maybe not the ultimate purpose. Yeah. So, so, from the $75 in your pocket situation to where you are now, what, what was that road like? I mean, it's a tough road because the one thing that I think this modern generation, and I include myself because I'm an older millennial, but, you know, millennials, young millennials, Gen Z, is they know there's a safety net there, mm. right? When I left home when I was 18 years old, I knew that was it. And no one had to tell me, yeah. right? Right. Mom didn't sit me down. Dad didn't sit me down and say, now, son, you go and you get your degree and you can go and get yourself a job. You're not coming back here to whatever. It was just this sense that I had. It was an unspoken truth that there's no going back. I've left the nest and that's it. And I wanted to call my dad when I was down to my last 75 bucks, feeling pathetic, right? You know, freezing cold. Um, What did your parents do for a living? So my mom was civil service at Fort Sill for her whole career. And then she, uh, she originally, or eventually retired from the army hospital. And then my dad's been at Goodyear since he was a teenager. And so he's worked in the factory until this day. And so, um, and I knew I could with one phone call solve that problem. 
right? Being down in my last 75 bucks, I could, you know, hey, dad, can I get some money? Or, you know, hey, grandpa, can I do this or do that? But there was just something in me that said, no, yeah. like, you're a man now, right? You, you were a man four years ago, technically, right? Mm -hmm. And legally. So figure it out. And, you know, take that odd job. Take that thing that you feel like is beneath you. Because, you know, when you graduate top of your class or something like that, you expect something, right? Like, ah, bow down to me. Give me my six-figure job in my corner office. Like, but no one cared in 2008. At the risk of uh, being a dick and interrupting you. You're good. Who am I kidding? I'm a dick and I'm going to interrupt you. <laughs> Uh, why do you suppose that that mentality is so fucking lost on on kids today? That the, the what you're talking yeah. about, not being forced into that position, because I mean, that yeah. that is what it is. Uh, I, I would say that that similarly, like my parents, I mean, we were by no no means of a lot of means. Uh, we weren't piss fucking broke, but you know we didn't have a lot. But we you know we weren't uh, missing meals and. Uh, being like, well, is it is it uh, ramen and hot dogs or do we have the lights on? I mean, it wasn't yeah. to that yeah. point. You know, but we certainly weren't rich anyway. My point is, is that my parents still sacrificed quite a bit, and they they offered, uh, you know, to pay for me to go to college, mm -hmm. and I said no. You know, I was like, I, I'm going to join the Navy, which I did at 17, right out of high school. I waited till I turned 18 to to go in, but but for me, I had that same feeling. You know, no nobody had to tell me to be that way. There was just something inherent that made me think like, no, this this is my fucking responsibility, not theirs, not anybody else's. Like if, if somebody's going to pay for me to go to college, it's going to be the military because I, I served and, and that was yep. the deal that we made. And, you know, I'm not, I hope that doesn't come across as me trying to blow my own own horn. I just, there, there wasn't something that, that made me do that. It just right. happened. And, and I, I wonder why that's such a fucking rarity these days. Uh, it, it seems like more and more kids just are more and more, there, there's more and more sense of, of entitlement to the point where it's not even just thinking that they deserve it. It's like believing that they do. Right. You know, it, it, it's like like this inherent fucking feeling that, that they are absolutely entitled to the world. And, and if not, then it's like the, the world's crumbling, mm -hmm. you know. And, and why do you suppose that is? So there are a lot of ways to answer that. And, you know, they have varying levels of being right. So <laughs> that innate voice inside of you telling you, no, do something else. You could call that God. You can call that the Holy Spirit. You can call that the muse, right? Stephen Pressfield may, may call that the muse, like whispering in your ear to do this as opposed to that. So that's kind of the ethereal answer to that question, right? Which may all be right. <clears throat> then you have kind of the practical answer, which is you have a generation of parents that were kind of latchkey parents, but also maybe didn't have a lot of means, maybe didn't go to school, and they wanted better for their kids. And around the same time all that's happening, you have the, the, prevo you know, the prevalent nature of the news media exploding. You know, Dateline NBC every Friday evening telling you about this kid that was, you know, kidnapped, raped, and murdered, and, you know, if only the parents had been more vigilant type of a thing. And then it's, no, 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 you can't ride your bike out to the to 7-Eleven. You'll never come back, yeah. right? It's kind of that, that mindset, right? So I'm sure there was a little bit of that. Um, but then I think something, this just kind of came to me, like a lot of parents want to be buddies with their kids. Mm -hmm. And like, my dad is my buddy, but he was my dad. Even when I outgrew him and, you know, might've been able to, to out fight him. Probably not. I was still terrified cause he's my dad. Yeah. But if you look at your, your mom or your dad and call them by their first name, I, I remember when I was in my early twenties, there was a kid, you know, where there was this group of guys, we would kind of do Bible study together and our parents all knew each other. And he called his mom by her first name in the presence of all of us. And I was the smallest guy out of, the, out of this crew, right? We had these brothers that were enormous. You and we him, snatched <laughs> that boy up. We put him up against the fridge and we said, never again. Yeah. Like we were appalled. Yeah. And even the mom was like appalled at us. Like, no, this is normal. It's like, no, this is disrespectful. Yeah, like she's awesome. mom, ma'am, and nothing else, yeah. right? But I, I don't think enough kids got snatched up. I don't think enough kids had to build that resilience, that, that ability yeah. to overcome because parents were in front of them, you know, throwing all the <clears throat> problems and potential pitfalls, like, you know, clearing the path for them, yeah. you know, picking them up before they started crying so that they wouldn't cry. And all that kind of manifests itself where you, you're in this K through 12 system that doesn't want you to think and wants you to think like they do. Yeah. Right. And then you go to college and it's more of the same, only worse. And so that there's probably a lot of reasons for that. Yeah. I, I think also one thing that just like with a lot of things, the, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Yeah, is, is that it's an overcorrection, and by that I mean that you know the, the politically correctness that kind of seemed like it transformed this country in the '90s uh, or so. 
I, I think stems largely from uh, child abuse is that, you know, th- there's, you know, people that are abusive to their kids. And, yeah. and so, you know, the state jumps in and, and wants to, uh, you know, mitigate that from happening and, and keep kids from being abused and, and, you know, physically fucking tortured and whatever else. The problem is, is that it's an overcorrection. Yeah. Right. You know, to the to the point with which now kids can't or uh, kids can't even be disciplined, or or parents can't, uh, you know, do what they consider uh, apt disciplinary measures, however they see fit, uh, mm-hmm. because they're scared. And and to me, when it gets to the point where kids know that you know you can't do a fucking thing to me, mm-hmm. that that's when you you've lost the battle. You know, and and I mean, it's it's really. I mean, I hate to, I don't hate to compare it. Who am I kidding? Kids and dogs are very similar. <laughs> is that uh, you know dogs are, are very much the same way. I mean, you just just tussled with uh, with Flip, right? Is that a, yep. a dog like that that physically and mentally is capable of of doing what they can do? You know, th- that's a dog that that just like with kids, as they get older, once they realize you know kind of what their potential is, if, if there's not some idea that, that there can be a consequence for certain yes. things then that motherfucker is going to be buck wild and, and, and going to turn into an absolute fucking nightmare. Right. You know? And Mike, you've probably seen the meme too, right? Where it used to be like the parents and the teacher on the same side of the desk getting after the kid. Yeah. And then it switched yeah. to the kid and the parents on the same side getting after the yeah. teacher. Yeah. And so at a certain point, the teacher is not going to push back against that anymore. They're going to be like, okay, yeah. fine. You know, let your kid run wild, let their kid do whatever. <clears throat> and they're never butting against, butting up against somebody that's yeah. kind of going to deal with them. And there's no, it takes a village mindset anymore. Yeah. Right. Can you imagine like in a modern day context, a kid's riding their bike on the other side of the neighborhood, doing something they're not supposed to be doing. And a neighbor snatching that kid up and giving them a spanking or a whoop. I would. Like, you know, but <laughs> yeah. like that, no, I know that to a mean. degree should be the expectation, yeah. but like yeah. you're going to go straight to jail now yeah. if you do that. Yeah. No, I know. It, it's uh, it's fucking criminal. And it's, uh, I think you see it in the, you know, the late teen, early twenties age kids now that are burning cities down and yanking statues off and, and, and doing that type of shit. I mean, they're all kids that, that have been able to do whatever the fuck they want to do their right. entire life. And now as they're adults, uh, you know, that, that transforms into, into what you see, I think. But, uh, yeah, it's fucking sad. I mean, I know that that, I'm assuming that, uh, you know, that, that there's an element of that that's kind of woven into, into what you do. Um, I, I would love to hear kind of from, from that, that point where, you know, it sounds like you're kind of at rock bottom 75 bucks to, you know, what you, what you did in the meantime between then and, uh, and to what you're doing now, it sounds like insurance was some of it. Uh, what, what all did you, did you do between, between that while you were kind of building this up? Man, I did. So I did insurance, you know, a couple of times I did, you know, I did lawn mowing, uh, the worst job possible, which is where they would give you these coupon books, which are actually pretty nice coupon books. And they would give you a map with like coordinates, you know, in a quadrant of the city and you'd put on a full suit regardless of, you know, time of year. And you would just walk door to door and ignore the no solicitation signs and walk in and try to sell these little coupon books, which, yeah. you know, if you use three of them, it'll, you know, pay for itself yeah. and like that kind of thing. And, you know, for years afterwards, I had like panic attacks going past mini malls because yeah. it's like the thought of just walking into each one of those nail salons and asking them to buy my crap. Yeah. But, you know, you did a bunch of those things. I had a job with Major League Baseball in New York City. It was kind of a, you know, kind of an uh, off the whim, a whim type of deal, uh, you know, where like 22,000 people applied for these 10 spots and I got one of them and Irv's nine spots and, you know, kind of was there for the 2012 baseball season and did a little oil and gas because, again, if you live in Oklahoma and Texas, you never worked in oil and gas. You pretty much got to get out. Um, and you know, you, you do a bunch of these, these different things and you kind of learn a little bit about yourself and all those places, but you also learn what's not acceptable to you. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, I have suits and they look great. They fit me well. And I know how to tie a double Windsor. I don't want to wear a suit every day. So you learn that about yourself, yeah. right? <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm a little different. I talk a little different when I'm in a suit and it's kind of douchey and I don't know if I like it, yeah. man. I feel like I'm being stuck in a cubicle farm. Right, you know, there's this clump of cubicles, and then oh, I work in the third clump of cubicles to the right. That works for some people; it's not for others. Um, it's kind of like I explained to somebody: if you're an introvert and pretend you're extroverted, you'll be miserable. And same is true in the opposite. Yeah. And so, along that path, you just kind of figure some things out. I did some consulting; I still do some consulting and things like that. But really, to be honest, it was this year where my wife and I kind of had the a burn the ships moment at the same time. Right, so. There was a company that I was doing some consulting with, and that constituted about 
90, 95% of the money I made in 2020 was with this company. So it was a really, really good gig. And then, you know, the gig was, wasn't there anymore. And I immediately had this thought, I wonder if this is, this is the time to push on Daunted Life, to really push the podcast, push the content to see where it goes. Lo and behold, my wife had the same exact thought and we didn't know it yet. It wasn't until we came together that night to kind of talk about next steps and what our plans were that we both kind of had this idea. And it was one of those things, Mike, to where it's like, you're doing things that are in your wheelhouse and in your gifting, right? A lot of people aren't. They're doing things that, you know, where they're, their skill sets over here and their giftings over here and, and what they like to do, it's, it's somewhere spread out in the middle. But you want to be right where your skill set meets with, you know, your abilities and what you're passionate about. And so I just didn't want to look back when I was 80 years old at, remember that time when I was in my early 30s and like- And I didn't seemed, hit on that hot yeah, yeah, chick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit different. I got the hot chick way before that. But it's like, I didn't want that to be the defining moment of my life because I didn't do something. I would rather the defining moment of my life, positive or negative, to be something that I did do. Because if this doesn't work out, and I've told my listeners and I've told my audience, if this isn't right, if, if my philosophy is off, if you're not getting value from what I'm doing, then act as the free market and don't listen to me anymore. Yeah. Don't donate anymore. Yeah. That will be my communication that I've done all I could in this area. I pushed it in every way that I could push. It just didn't quite work out. And I can yeah. live with that. Yeah. During all of that time, like was, uh, I know you mentioned, uh, you know, within the last year, there was kind of a burn the ships moment, but yeah. during the, the different phases of your life, was there like a, a light switch moment where it was kind of almost epiphany, like where you were like, you know what, th- this is what I need to be doing. Or, or was it kind of a culmination to in the last year, what you're talking about? So uh, around kind of my mid twenties, and this was a, this was a story I didn't share with, with anybody for years. Cause I was just like, I didn't know what to do with it. So I was doing what I normally do. I'm running sprints and, you know, trying to torture myself in the middle of the, the summer heat in Oklahoma. And I get to the end of one of these sprints and, you know, I'm recovering and I'm walking back to the starting line and I'm not one of those people, like, I'm sure you have people in your life that have said like, oh, I can hear God. God and I conversate, you know, throughout the day. It's just kind of like this direct line of communication thing. And some people do have that. And I legitimately believe that. Um, but I didn't, I didn't have that communicative, you know, embrace and all those types of things. But I felt like everything quieted down, like right? Not a bird was chirping, like no cars driving by. And I felt like God told me, you're going to be the next generation's John Eldridge. So for anyone who doesn't know who John Eldridge is, he's a very prolific author, but he wrote the seminal men's ministry book called Wild at Heart, okay? This book was published like in 2000, 2001, right? So it's, it's been around for a while, sold a bunch of copies, and it kind of launched his career as kind of a guy that speaks to men. And I really, really liked the book, but he was the guy in that space, right? But John Eldridge and I have very, very different styles, right? I'm a little bit more bombastic. I'm a little bit more physical, a little bit more forward. He's a little bit more backwards, a little bit more subdued. Uh, he comes from like a counseling background. So that's kind of his skill set and where he's, he's best, right? He would be best in like a dyadic situation, but like maybe not <laughs> as impactful in a room full of 5,000 guys, but the anti Tony Robbins. Yeah. So well, you, to, to that degree, cause Tony yeah. Robbins is this physical specimen. He's, he's huge. And he's got all these things like, and he's got that booming voice and he's more subdued. <clears throat> and I just remember thinking like, Dude, that is so cocky. I can't tell anyone that. You're going to be the next generation's best-selling author who everyone points to in the Christian space as that's the men's ministry guy. Yeah. And so I just basically, you know, you know, folded that up, put it in my pocket, <laughs> and then just left it there. But even as I was helping some other ministries do some things and helping them with some, with some content, with some logistics and stuff throughout my 20s, that was always nagging at me. Like maybe there's something unique about my perspective. Maybe there's something unique about my voice, not my literal voice, but like how I would say something Mm -hmm. that would speak to a guy. And all that came to a head. uh, I forget what the year would be, 2016, 2017. So uh, Uversion is one of the most downloaded apps ever. I think it's been downloaded six, 700 million times. Like it's, it's a Bible app. It's fantastic. It was actually founded in my backyard, a couple miles from my house, Life Church. They, they founded, they helped found this thing. And it's, you know, it's gone around the world, hundreds of languages. It's great. But I would go through the devotionals, right? So they have devotionals for women and devotionals for people who are depressed and devotionals for people who this and that and blah, blah, blah. And so I would go to the men's devotional section and I would read some of them and they felt like women's devotionals for men, right? 
So it was like a woman or an effeminate man wrote it, but they would put like camo on the artwork or like metal or wood and oh, we're manly. Like fo- Fox devotions for the hens. Yeah. So it, it's exactly <laughs> that type of setup. So it's like, yeah. it's a sheep trying to pretend to be a sheep dog, kind yeah. of a, kind of a situation. And I remember talking to someone that was on staff at that church and I'm like, man, these devotionals like really suck. Yeah. Like they super suck. <clears throat> and he was like, all right, big guy, how about you write one? I was like, you can just do that. You can just write one. He's like, yeah, you can write it, submit it. And if they like it, they'll put it on the app. So I was like, okay, cool. So I had some time and it, it took me, it took me several weeks, but uh, I wrote a 21 day devotional, right? Where I was kind of fleshing out some of my philosophies around these three things, physical, mental, and spiritual resilience, right? Those, those three things. How can a man be spiritually, mentally, physically resilient in, in his life? And there's a lot of reasons behind those three things and why resilience and not strength and all that. But I wrote seven devotionals per category. So it been, ended up being 21 days and I submit it to them. They accept it. I'm like, okay, this is great. It's going to go on the app. I'm I wish famous. I would have reread it once or twice before <laughs> you jokers decide to put it out there to the world. Yeah. But then I basically, like, I forgot about it. I had a few friends that read it and, you know, they thought it was okay, but then I, I basically forgot about it. But this was months down the road. The same staff member and I went out to lunch. Like, hey, let's, let's catch up. Let's go grab pizza kind of a deal. And as we're leaving lunch, he goes, hey, man, Kyle, congratulations, by the way. And I'm like, awesome. I accept. Congratulations for what exactly? He's like, you, you haven't seen? I'm like, seen what? He's like, your devotional <clears throat> is the second most read men's devotional on the app. Oh, shit. behind the pastor of the church who wrote this man's book and like he gets every push possible yeah. you know, marketing wise. And I was like, whoa, okay. Cause we're talking tens of thousands of people had not only downloaded the devotional, had not only started it, but finished it. Yeah. Right. I think as of today, it's 60 or 70,000 people have finished it and men don't read men don't do things for 21 days in a row. Right. Yeah. Um, and so that's when it really kind of came to me like, Maybe there's something unique about what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. Yeah. And I'm unapologetic in how I approach things. And, you know, that, that kind of led to the podcast because I don't enjoy writing that much. I would rather put five bullet points on a piece of paper and then flow for 45 minutes. Yeah. So which leans more towards the podcast medium than sure. it does to, to writing. Um, and so that's, that's kind of where it was almost like the world or the universe or God was telling me, yes. You did hear correctly when you were running sprints. That was not indigestion. Like that was not the devil. That was not any, any, that was, that was me. You were built for this. And so that's just kind of been something that's kind of been, you know, the, the, the driving force behind a lot of things that I've done behind starting the podcast, behind writing more devotionals. It's like, Hey, I put you here to do this. So you better do it. So what would you say the, uh, I mean, not the 30 second elevator pitch, but you know, the, the, the gist of what you're trying to accomplish with it. Well, the, from the introduction, you said, you know, my mission is equipping men to push back darkness. Specifically, we do that by providing content that helps men forge spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. Can you, uh, for the listener and me, can yeah. you define your version of darkness? That's a great question. Um, darkness comes in many forms, and it depends on your worldview how you're going to fight it. So if you don't think there's a spiritual realm, if you think we're matter, right? Everything's just matter, right? We're stardust bumping into other stardust. Then you're going to push back darkness. Maybe that's philosophical, right? You're going to push back against critical race theory. You're going to push back against Marxism. You're going to push back against, you know, pick a thing, right? Pick a hot button thing. And so I want to equip men to be able to do that because a lot of people were caught sleeping in 2020, they didn't know who their sheriff was. They didn't know who their mayor was. They didn't know who was on school board. They didn't know who was on city council until those people that, you know, seven or eight people basically ran their lives and ran their kids' lives and told them whether or not their kids could be educated, whether or not their job was essential, right? And because they were caught asleep, they didn't know how to fight those battles. So the easiest way to talk about this is like the abortion topic, right? So where it's like, you're pro-life. Great, you're pro-life. Well, why, why can you tell a woman what she can do with her own body? And if you just melt and you have no comeback to that, like <clears throat> then, then your, your viewpoint is worthless because you can't defend it. You can't give an apologetic for why you believe what you believe. So there's that kind of darkness, right? That, that's cultural darkness, philosophical darkness. But then there's also spiritual darkness, right? 
So whether you believe in it or not doesn't change whether or not it's real. You cannot believe in gravity, but if you and I walk up to the top of this building and swan dive off, we will hit the ground regardless of our belief. Do you find anything uh, in terms of pushback? Um, gravity is, is easy to prove. Sure. Right? Like I, I, I can prove that it exists by jumping mm -hmm. off of the off of the building. Uh, for some of it, it says, okay, uh, in the realm of what we're talking about, prove, uh, how right. do you prove what you're talking about that it exists, whether you believe in, in it or not that same way? Yeah. I would ask you, can you see gravity? No. Can you, you smell can, it? Can you, can you, you taste you, it? No, but you can, you can for fuck sure feel it if you fall off of a roof. Exactly. And in those <clears> moments <throat> when people are on their knees and their whole life is falling apart, they can for sure feel God's presence. And that's, that's a kitschy answer. I'll yeah. admit it from the very beginning. It sounds like I took it straight off of TBN or K-Love or something like that. Yeah. But you don't prove God in the same way that you prove what makes up water. You know, two hydrogens and one oxygen, right? You, you don't prove it in the same way. And so some people, they prove that, and you can never prove it unequivocally, right? There is a belief element, but there's a belief element in almost every single worldview and system. You subscribe to a certain way of seeing things. Even right. scientism, which is kind of like a new religion to where it's like, okay, well, if science can't explain it now, it'll explain it later. It'll explain it eventually. Mm -hmm. And so with that particular lifestyle, what I would, what I would inter, like interject to that person or maybe interact with them a little bit more on that point is there is evidence for things that can't be proven using one means of proof. Yeah. And so because I would also ask a scientist, like, prove to me you love your wife using science. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I understand that. I guess, you know, for me, the where, where I struggle with the, the gravity analogy is that, like, I, I can, we collectively could prove that right now. Like, you know, you and I can make each other feel gravity by sure. pushing pushing ourselves or each other off the fucking... Yeah. Uh, off the roof, whereas you know the the example used of somebody at their lowest uh, you know point in their life for sure felt God. What if nobody's at that? What if you know what like how how do you make somebody feel that right now the same way that you can make them feel gravity? Yeah, I feel like there's and that's a fair question. Some people ask that unfairly, but yeah, you know, I can obviously see that you're asking it fairly. Some people will immediately go to scripture, and I understand why they do that. However, if someone doesn't believe the Bible is the inherent word of God mm -hmm. and you start making biblical arguments from Leviticus and Isaiah and second Corinthians, yeah. it's just not, it's not going to land because they don't believe that, right? Like yeah. that's not their paradigm. <clears throat> and so one of the most valuable books that I've ever read and people have their problems with it is a book by Tim Keller called the reason for God. So Tim Keller, very, very short story, uh, New York city pastor, right? So almost everyone that comes into his church at some point or another was not churched right? They didn't grow up in, you know, mm -hmm. North Texas. They didn't grow up in central Oklahoma. You know, these are not churched people. These are a lot of people that come from more of a secular background, right? And so when he would start engaging with these people after his Sunday sermons, most of the arguments he was giving them for why it was reasonable to believe in God were reason-based. Yeah. And so he wrote that book where the first seven chapters were, <clears throat> here are the top seven arguments I've gotten from people to say that God couldn't possibly exist. And he kind of explained their points of view. He steel manned, not straw man, he steel manned their points of view. And then he kind of like, you know, dissected them a little bit. But then the last seven arguments, the last seven chapters of the book were his arguments based on reason alone as to why it is reasonable to believe in a creator God, right? Because it's hard for people to get to the deity of Jesus if they don't believe that God like created everything, mm -hmm. including you, including me, including Jesus, right? Yeah. Like it, it's hard to kind of square that circle. And so I kind of meet people where they're at in that type of a setting. I've, I've had friends who the worst people they knew growing up, growing up were Christians, right? The most racist, the most vile, the, the least polite were Christians, right? But they were really godly on Sundays, yeah. right? And if that's your paradigm, you see the guy with his squeaky clean shoes and his shirt tucked in and press and all that, and his wife looks great, but then he's horrible to his employees and he's horrible to people in traffic and to waitresses. <clears throat> it's kind of hard for that to be your paradigm, but I've kind of walked people through these types of arguments and it's like, okay, that makes more sense. Then you can start talking about, can we trust the scripture? Can we, can we, you know, can we really look at this as, as not just a collection of these stories that no one really believes anymore, yeah. but you know, a directives for how we should live a moral life. And so that's kind of where it gets when you start really getting into the theological weeds with people. But all that's a conversation. Like most people think it's kind of a snap deal. I'm like, Oh, your mind's changed. It's like, no, no, no. Like that's a relationship with somebody. That's a lot of conversations before. Yeah, their mind no, for sure. And I, I mean, I, uh, you know, for me again, like sharing my, my personal journey as, as it relates to that is, 
you know, growing up, I was very, uh, very much into um, just the the thought process of Christianity. I, I hate to use the word religious because I, I think there's too many connotations that uh, distract people from what the message is when you when you use that. But uh, I mean, I, I was a I, w- I would say a staunch Christian for you know most of my early life. Uh, where I would say that there was a, a transition with that uh, was again after I'd been in the Navy for a few years and been uh, to a lot of different parts of the world and seen uh, you know cultures that were vastly different from ours that um, you know all felt similarly to to the way we are here. Uh, you know they they kind of bandwagon on to whatever they grew up with. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, no different than different cultural things that you believe that, that are, um, you know, not just not the case, you know, we'll use some, some, uh, you know, holiday religion, Santa Claus, Easter bunny, tooth fairy, things like that is is that, you know, when you grow up thinking that that they exist, you know, that it's not uncommon for you to think that they exist long past what, what you start to really have reason, like you're in high school and you're like, yeah, I'm pretty sure Santa Claus is bullshit, you know, uh, but there's still <laughs> an element, the, yeah. but it's, you know, it's almost like the, uh, what's that movie, the Polar Express, you know, it's like you still yeah. kind of want to believe a little bit, you know, but as you get older, it just gets to that point. And so my, my point in bringing that up, I'm not, I'm not uh, necessarily comparing Jesus to Santa Claus, uh, but, but in, in that, you know, as you grow up with certain things, obviously you're, you're much more likely to believe that. And, and when you see cultures that, uh, you know, are about 180 degrees different from from the way they are here, and, and they feel as uh, as strongly as as a lot of people here do that, that they're quote unquote right, uh, or or that we're wrong, uh, or that you know everybody else is wrong, or your God is bullshit, or you know these these uh, cu- cultural uh, representations are are hedonistic or or you know heretic based or, or yeah. what have you. Um, you know, it just, it starts to make you think, you know, like, mm-hmm. well, wh- why is there such a disparity between different parts of the world that way? Um, you know, and then for me, where, where I think it, it, it really shifted for me and, and this, you know, like you said, this wasn't like a, a 10 minute conversation. I mean, this mm-hmm. was years of, of kind of, uh, evolving, uh, thought processes for, for me, uh, is, is just the amount of shitty things that people do to each other. Uh, you know, human nature is, is pretty fucking terrible uh, across the board. Yeah, there are a lot of good people. There's a lot of fucking terrible people, too. Uh, you know, and, and to me, at least my understanding of, of us being made in the image of God and, and being his children is that I know free will is a, is a thing that gets, uh, you know, kind of plucked out as being the, uh, the saving grace, if you will, yeah. of why people get to do whatever the fuck they want. My take is this, is that I, I'm a father. Um, if If... As my kids, whether they're fucking two years old or, you know, if I make it to the to the great age of ninety and they're you know in their sixties or whatever, um, you know, or I'll just use I'll use an example of them growing up as a better example is that you know if if at five and seven years old, one of them has a two by four with nails sticking out of it, getting ready to hit the other one over the head with it, I'm gonna step in on that one, you know, and, and so to me. It's like, if I think of it, you know, trying to step out of the, this is what I grew up with and this is what I was taught Mm -hmm. and look at it purely as a, does this make sense? You know, using the word reason, you know, the reasons for God. And I I like the the kind of play on words there is that the the reason, reasoning and using reason and logic and thinking about it to me, like at this point in my life, it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. You know, is is that if, if I, I can't put myself in God's shoes, um, on the same token, if we're if we're his children, I just I don't understand how you can create uh, a, a planet filled with you know almost eight billion people that many of whom uh, largely do really really fucking terrible things to one another, uh, and to me that that just doesn't make sense. And especially when when you think of it, even you know when when it's kids getting leukemia at two years old or seven year old girls getting kidnapped and tortured yeah. and raped and and. You know, to me, you know, you hear God has a plan for everybody uh, quite often. And, and from my standpoint, you know, again, I just look at it, you know, I try to look at it logically and thinking is that what kind of fucking twisted plan is that? Right. Uh, is, is that if, if there's a sentient being that creates a group of people that does that to each other, when you when he has the choice, you know, if, if all of this exists in, in the manner in w- with which it does, 
if I have a choice to create a, a planet with a bunch of people on it, I'm not going to give them that kind of option to, to do things like that to, to each other. I just wouldn't. Right. Like, I, I think that's a sick, twisted fucking thing to do. Uh, and so for me, that, that's where I struggle with it. Now, I will say I'm not atheist. Uh, you know, I, I don't not believe. I don't know what to believe. Sure. You know, I'm, I'm at a point in my life where I, I have enough questions and, and doubts to where I, I for sure wouldn't say, yeah, I'm, I'm a, a Christian and I wave that flag and I, I believe all of it. Yeah. I, I'm not saying that, it, that it's completely out of the realm of possibility for that to exist, too. I, ju I just don't know. And, and you know, again, as I get older, I'm more of a fucking show me. I, you know, I'm more yeah. bitter. I'm more cynical about everything and everybody I meet. I've been bullshitted and fucked over enough times to, to say, like, if you, if you can't fucking prove it, then I don't want to hear about it, you know, type of thing. And, and, and some of that is, is again, it's just life experience of, of things happening, of trusting people and, and thinking things and getting fucked over in the process. And so I'm, I'm curious not to completely hijack this entire interview and, and talk just about religion, but to me, that's a, a benchmark principle in, in, in what you're teaching and, and, yeah. and kind of the bedrock uh, woven in, into a lot of what you talk about. So I'm curious what, what your take is on that. Well, I, I really appreciate you going into that because it's, it's important to kind of hear and feel where you're coming from. And, and one thing I did want to key on before I kind of go wherever else I decide to go with this, when someone says, oh, that's just God's plan, in my opinion, you should not take that person seriously. Mm -hmm. In the same way that you don't take someone seriously when you're going through the crap and they say, hey, let me know if you need anything, Yeah. right? Everything they don't, happens for a reason. They don't mean it, right? Yeah. Like, hey, just, hey, if there's anything I can do to help, just let us know. No, no, no. A real friend is going to think about what needs to happen, right? Mm -hmm. Like when my son was six weeks old and we were rushing him to the hospital in the middle of the night to potentially get emergency surgery, one of my buddies, one of my guys that I call in, in my foxhole, he was on his way to my house. He called me because he knew what was going on. He was on his way to my house and he called me to say, Kyle, I'm taking care of the dogs for you. What do I need to do? Ha tell me how I get in, right? Yeah. I'll figure it out. He was, I'm on my way, right? He wasn't, let me think about it. I'm praying for you, brother. No, no, no. It was like, I'm on my way. <laughs> I, I'm in, I'm in action mode, right? Yeah. So when someone tells you, hey, it's just God's plan and they don't give you any other, uh, like that's a childish answer to a very adult question. But to kind of get back to the whole worldview thing. So the problem of evil, the problem of pain, is probably the number one thing that keeps people from belief in God, from a discipleship with Christ, those types of things. Because of the seven-year-old girl that gets cancer, suffers, and dies. Because of the five-year-old boy that is raped and murdered and mercilessly, like those types of scenarios. Mm -hmm. Basically, the crap that you saw overseas and worse, the crap Holly McKay saw overseas and worse, and she detailed in her book, which is still haunting to this day, to even just have read it, much less smelled it and seen it, right, which she did. Yeah it's hard to think that there could possibly be a being out there that actually cares. But when you dive into that mindset, you dive into that worldview further, you have to think about it practically. That if you're God, if you're this omniscient, omni-everything being, and you're going to create little beings kind of like you, but not really, and you're like, I'm going to create this world. If you create a world where nothing bad could possibly happen ever, you've created a world full of robots automatons, as C.S. Lewis would call it, right, in mere Christianity, that is not a worth, world worth creating, yeah. right? If there's no capacity for love, then the, you have to have free will that undergirds that capacity to love. The problem with that is if you believe in, in the, the Genesis account, and we're in a post-Genesis 3 world, everything's broken, Satan helped us bust everything up through Adam and Eve, great, like if that's what you believe, and you know that's kind of how we got here. But you allow the possibility of evil when you allow the possibility of love, which is not a comforting answer to a dad whose kid yeah. is dying in his arms. You know what I mean? No, but, for, yeah, for sure. I mean, and, and I get that 100% and that, you know, obviously with what I do for a living, I tie dog training into just about everything. But it's, it's similar in, in that way in that, you know, one of the things that I talk about, uh, a lot of people have a, a purely positive approach to dog training, right? It's all yeah. positive yeah. reinforcement. Uh, and, and while there are occasional dogs where that works, you know, they have just the right blend of, of just enough drive for either affection, food, toys, treats, you know, what, whatever, but not so much drive to where it, it trumps what you can offer them to reinforce yeah. something and they blow you off and go chase the squirrel and, and whatever, uh, is that, yes, there are some dogs that can be trained by, by the, those mechanisms, but not very many of them. Most of them you need a, a balance. And, and, you know, the, the one thing that I say is good without the contrast of bad, it isn't good. Okay. And to me that that's exactly what, what you're, what you're talking about is that, you know um, you know, if, if there's, 
if it's all good, then none of it's good. It's like everybody's a winner. Sure. Well, if everybody's a winner, everybody's a fucking loser too. Then. At the same time, right? Uh, you know, so I, I completely understand that. I guess I'm looking at it, you know, from the the thirty thousand foot view of saying, okay, well, I still don't get what the fucking point is. Then, like, if if I am him, it, Z, yeah, well, they, there, yeah. you know, whatever the fuck you want. We've call officially them. been canceled. Uh, Shut it down. Yeah, I don't care. No, yeah, you know, uh, you can just stop listening, but. <laughs> Uh, no, everybody at this point, if, if they have been offended uh, or if they haven't been offended, this is by yeah, everything else we've said, this, this isn't going to do it. I yeah. promise you that. But, but to me, like, you know, so, okay, I don't want to create robots because then what's the point? But I also, in thinking to myself, like, why, why would you create then a group of people that still, that if, if I know, I mean, I can only imagine it's like a, a stereo equalizer where like you can give them a certain amount right. of free will. Like maybe I give them just a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. but not enough to where they're fucking murdering each other and raping each other and doing these things that, that are crushing the rest of people's lives, you know, sure. their parents, their siblings, whatever, you know, um, you know, so to me again, it just, it, it seems like that seems like a sick twisted fucking thing to do. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Um, the thing with the way you're framing it, you're framing it fairly and you're not wrong in terms of, because you're describing what you're observing, right? Mm -hmm. You can only say someone's doing something wrong if they're looking at, you know, a green shirt and calling it purple. Like they're, they're trying to be deceptive. But what you're describing is exactly what most people describe when they're trying to really work through how this could possibly be. Because these are still questions that I have as well. Like I, I'm not a zealot in the fact that it's like, oh, all the questions that could possibly come up have been answered. And guess what? I have them all. Would you like some? Like yeah. I, I don't presume to, to know the answer in all those situations. In this type of a setup, whenever you have people that are trying to figure out how, how they could possibly work through a situation, there's a few things that come in. People are assuming that they know more than they know. So when you look at a situation, you see the result of evil. Young girl, raped, murdered, decapitated, the whole nine, right? You see the result of evil and you say, that is bad. That's bad that that happened. You're also assuming that there can be no good that comes from that, which is weird to even say out loud, but just follow me. So you're assuming that there's no good that can come from that situation. You're assuming that there can be no good outcome. What you're also assuming is that you're saying it's bad, but you're saying that based on what? Because if you have a strictly materialist, humanist worldview, that's just atoms bumping into atoms. There's no evil, right? But if you believe there's such a thing as bad, you have to believe there's something that's good, you know, that contrasts bad, right? Or evil and good type of a thing. And then in order to differentiate between good and evil, there has to be some sort of moral law with which we can compare this act to to say this is a good thing that's happened. Oh, you gave a girl a sucker because she wanted one. Oh, or you raped her and murdered her, right? And that there has to be some sort of a differentiation. But when you're talking about a moral law, and apologists have pointed this out, you're talking about something that's applied about people or for or to people, mm -hmm. right? So that inherently begs the question that there must be a moral law giver that gives the law that allows us to differentiate between good and evil. So there's a few tendrils kind of going through there that you have to compare those situations to. But here's, here's the other thing. And this comes back to some of the stuff we were talking about. You mentioned the riots last year, Black Lives Matter and Antifa and all these different things. When there's only earthly justice, you have to burn the building down. You have to throw the Molotov cocktail. You have to throw the brick at the police officer. You have to do those things because we only have justice on this planet, right? So the girl who was raped and murdered and decapitated, there's no justice for her because guess what? You shot him right after he did that. Maybe that's your justice, but maybe some other people think that justice would have been torture for that person. Mm -hmm. Ad infinitum until we decide we don't want to torture him anymore. But from my worldview, I believe that every tear that's ever been shed will be picked up again. I believe that every painful th blow that's been delivered will be rescinded and that we will have a new heaven and we will have a new earth. And that's not, not just comfort that helps me sleep at night because I'm a small-minded you know, miscreant. I believe that there is an ultimate judgment that we will all face and we will have to fess up and none of us will have hit the standard that was set forth, the standard of Christ, the perfect standard, right? Yeah. This might be a little churchy for some, but that's well, that's kind of the thing is that's how you kind of square the circle of a certain worldview. Yeah, no, and, and I mean, I, I understand 100% where you're coming from. I think where I struggle with it is that in, in knowing that nobody's perfect and, and mm -hmm. you know, your, your comment just now of nobody's going to hit that mark. <clears throat> so again, I, to me, that begs the question, then, then, then what's the point? 
yeah. is that if nobody's good enough and, and the only real, at least to, to my knowledge, the only real, uh, you know, measuring stick in terms of, of, of you qualifying to, to spend the afterlife, you know, in a, in a better spot, you know, is to believe one simple yeah. principle, right? So to me, then again, it's like, well, then, then what's the fucking point? Is, is that like if, if the guy who raped and murdered that kid, right, can ultimately seek salvation and, and accept Jesus into yeah. his heart, like, but, but then this other person that, that didn't do that but still doesn't make the grade because, well, maybe they fucking cheated on their wife or, or maybe they didn't pay their fucking taxes. They or, end up or, in the hellfire. Right? You know, or, or, yeah, be, but because, you know, so to me, like, Again, I, I get that, that the whole premise of like, well, you just don't understand because it's, it's way above, above your, your head of, of, uh, of understanding what, what the afterlife may or may not be sure. or, or what God is really like, uh, you know, and, and, and what, how that all works. But again, it's just to me like if, if I'm in the position of, to be able to create a planet and, and people, there's certain things that, that I would, I would want to give them, you know, not just yeah. like, Hey, you can basically do whatever the fuck you want. As long as you believe one thing. And, and at some point at the end of your life, you, We're good. you, you know, then that's fine. Everything yeah. else is essentially fair game. Like to me, that seems fucked. It just does. Like, mm -hmm. and, and, and I, I have yet to ever come across anybody that can, that can, can really explain it to where it doesn't seem fucked up to me. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's just how I see it. I, I don't know how to see it any other way, I guess, you know, I mean, I'm, I will say I want to caveat that with like I'm not close minded about it. I sure. like I, I enjoy talking about it. I, I think about it pretty regularly. I, I mean, I've my kids have asked me certain things and like I don't steer them in one direction or, or, or another. I tell them how I feel about things and what I think. And this goes with everything. Like, I mean, I, I've changed my mind on social issues. I've changed my mind on political issues. I've changed my mind on dog training issues, on, on yeah. life stances that I used to take that I don't take anymore. Like I'm not from my perspective, a closed minded person about it. Like I, like I said, I enjoy talking about it. I, I just, I can't wrap my head around th those couple of things that just seem like they're just not fucking right. Yeah. You well, the, the great thing about your worldview and how you're framing it is that you're a skeptic, not a cynic, right? So a skeptic is open. They just have questions and their yeah. questions aren't softball questions, right? Whereas a cynic, it doesn't matter what you show them, right? Yeah. If you show them a million miracles, they wish they had had a million and one, right? Yeah. That's what it'll take to convince me. And so the thing where a lot of Christians get uncomfortable, and so you mentioned Santa Claus and Jesus earlier. And a lot of people pointed this out. Some people don't like the comparison, but <clears throat> a lot of kids, they learn about God at the same time that they're learning about Santa Claus and the Easter bunny and the tooth fairy. Yeah. And we tell them to leave the latter three alone and keep the first one, mm -hmm. right? And then as they grow up, they're surrounded by a bunch of immature Christians that answer every t difficult question with, with, well, you're just going to have to pray about it. Yeah. Well, I guess there's no way to know, so we're just going to have to keep moving on. They have you to know, have that accent. Praise the Lord. Yeah, it's, every, it's, every, it's everything like that. And guess yeah. what? That is a child that yeah. needs an answer. Yeah. So if they were to say, Daddy, how do I cook a steak? And you say, pray about it, son. Yeah. Figure it out, son. That's also a stupid answer. Yeah. And so... I think that there's an epidemic of Christians that one can't defend their worldview and they can't answer these questions. But I say all that to say there are things that are knowable and then there are things that are not knowable yeah. and each person's knowable and unknowable might be different. And so I don't presume to be that person who's magically going to be able to explain it in a way that makes sense enough for you to change everything. Right. Mm -hmm. All that I can point to is say that in my opinion, it is knowable. So, so I go back to that book, the, the reason for God, the buddy that I t talked about who, you know, the worst people he knew growing up with Christians and all that. So he found out I was a Christian and I just didn't fit the mold of Christian that he had ever been around before. He's like, you work out, you don't cuss all the time. Like you're, you're not horribly racist. Like you're, you, you seem to be hitting the mark. And so we go through that book together, right? So we go to Chick-fil-A <clears throat> once a week for lunch and, you know, we go over one chapter at a time. So we spent 14, 15 weeks going over this book, right? So we get to the end of the book. And I'm like, so where are you at on all this, man? Like, you know, that, that's all the stuff that I could possibly talk to you about. Where are you at on this? And he goes, man, I'm so thankful that you like were patient with me and we talked about these things and that's great. Now I feel like I need to do the same thing with a Sikh and a Muslim and a Hindu and, you know, a scientist. And, a, you know, he just named all these things, right? And I looked at him and I was like, buddy, I completely understand that perspective right? Like that makes logical sense that that would be the next few things that you would need to, to tick off. But what I said to him is I said, I can maybe save you a bunch of time. 
Because there's one thing that you need to reckon with and figure out if you believe it or if you don't. Because if you don't, eat your heart out. Go research everything on the planet. But I said the one thing that you need to reckon with is whether or not you believe Jesus, a Middle Eastern Jew that existed in the area of Nazareth and the rest of the Middle East, was crucified and died on a Roman cross and was resurrected the third day or not. Because we can talk about Moses. We can talk about the parting of the Red Sea. We can talk about Noah. We can talk about Jonah and the whale. We can talk about all this stuff. I can talk about dinosaurs. We can talk about all that. But if he wasn't resurrected from the dead and is not the son of God, then you don't need to worry about the rest of it. They're just kids' stories at that point. Mm -hmm. And I would like to say that that was his big crescendo moment. And we all, we got up and we hugged and I took him and we baptized him immediately. That's not how it worked out. Right? He said, I'm going to have to think about it. He's thinking about it. But that's all that we <laughs> yeah. needed in that scenario was yeah. for him to continue questioning. I yeah. don't presume to have the questions. Yeah. My job is to point him towards where I think he can find truth. Yeah. I, I think one of the things that, uh, at least for me, I know in every other aspect of life, I, I think it's important to go into whatever it is that you're, whatever it is that you're talking about with, with the understanding that you might be wrong. Right. Absolutely. And so that, that would be my question to you is, is do you, do you ever think that you might be wrong Yes. in, in terms of believing in God and, and all that? Like, is there ever an element like, yeah, I could be fucking totally wrong on this. Absolutely. And it yeah. goes back to something you said earlier, Mike, which is like, I can't put God in a beaker and, you know, heat him up and prove that he exists because yeah. of the things I witnessed yeah. in the beaker. I mean, to me, it's refreshing to hear you say that though, because I think there's a lot of people that are in, in, Maybe not similar positions, but but similar positions in terms of defending that position. Yeah. They're like, no, I'm not wrong. It's like it's 100. percent It's like, well, pick any other fucking thing that you're talking about. Like if you if you take that mentality into it, guess what? You are wrong. You yeah. know, like and you're useless to the situation. Yeah. Yeah, you can't have a conversation with that person. That's yeah. a zealot. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting for sure. It's fascinating. I mean, to me, like we could spend days talking about you know sure. all, all the different things. Um, you know, and, and again, for me, it's, it's, uh, it's something that I, I wouldn't say that I've struggled with. I just, you know, I've gotten to the point where, uh, where, you know, my, my worldviews have, have changed a fair bit because of that. But, uh, but again, I, I, uh, I also am, am, uh, you know, of, of the mentality that, that, you know, I, I know I could be wrong. I really have no idea, you know, so for me, it's just, it's a hard, hard spot to be in. And, and, I think one of the things that probably drives my mentality with it a lot is, is dog training is, is for having done it professionally now for as long as I have, that's such a black and white, yeah. you know, proof positive type of thing, you know, because it's like, if somebody says, you know, Hey, okay, I'm going to buy a personal protection dog from you and the dog needs to be able to do X, Y, and Z. And now I show up and, and it can't, you know, it's like, show me that the dog can fucking lay there while I row a, roll a tennis ball past it. And I do that and it doesn't do it. It's like, well, no, he can do it. He just didn't do it then. It's like, well, you just got to believe that he can. It's like, no, he's got to be able to fucking do it, you know? Sure. And so whether it's a police department, a personal protection dog, a, a pet dog or whatever, like if what I'm trying to teach people doesn't work and, and, and is not having the desired results, I mean, whether it's dog training, whether it's weightlifting, whether it's jujitsu, you know, mm -hmm. you show up to a jujitsu gym and the dude can't fucking submit a white belt. It's like, well, I'm not going to fucking listen to you. Like no. you can't do anything. Uh, you know, so to me, that, that's where, where I think I have the, the hardest time with it is just as I get older and, and, and again, I've seen enough bullshitters out there that you're just like, well, what the fuck? And I think when you contrast that or, or couple that rather with, uh, you know, scandals in the Catholic Church with, you know, stuff like that or, right. uh, or again, you know, the, the to catch a predator on fucking Brian Williams and, the, you know, mm -hmm. some pastor from a local church that's yep. fucking nine-year-old boys or whatever and you're just yep. like... Well, what the fuck? You know? Yeah, it's hard. Uh, it's hard for me to to feel grace in yeah. those types of moments. But there's something you said that I I keyed on, and it's it's you've you've said things similar to this on your show and, and in your books and all that. But if you don't come into a situation, whether it's training a dog, parenting a kid, or a worldview discussion like this with humility, there's going to be a lot of potential issues yeah. for for that conversation. And here's the other thing: the reason why, and some people are going to bristle at how I answered your question earlier about like I. I can't know for sure that that's how it's going to be. I can't know for sure these things. The, the thing underneath a question like that and an answer like the one that I gave is when I keep a humble mindset about my worldview, that means I can continue to question it and challenge it. Because I tell people this all the time on my show. If you disagree with my opinion, I don't care to hear it. 
Yeah. I, I just really don't care. I have so many things I have to worry about that if you just bristle at a word I used or a way I described something and framed it, I don't have a lot of time for that. However, if I said something that was factually incorrect, or if you feel like I was being deceptive in how I framed something, point that out every time you see it. Yeah. Because if I'm wrong, I want to know. Yeah. I want to know immediately that I'm wrong. And when you're constantly challenging your worldview and putting it up against, you know, breaking it on the rock of new atheism and breaking it on the rock of, you know, Confucianism and all these different worldviews, you come to one that makes the most sense for you. And you can be, you know, you can be evangelical about it. And I, from, from my worldview, I feel like that's the most appropriate thing to do because if you have the best worldview and you keep it hidden, then you're not doing a service to the people that you could be sharing it with, right? Yeah. But I think that that's a great mindset because for you as a dog trainer, if you close your mind to anything that you've ever seen and heard and there's nothing new that can come, you're potentially going to not be the best trainer for the dog, for the person that ends up taking on the dog. It could lead to someone being killed overseas that you wish would have survived. Yeah. But you have to keep your mind open to these new ways of thinking. But ultimately there is truth that can be found. We don't live in a completely relativistic world where truth is just whatever you feel like it is at that moment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, ego gets in the way most, most of the time of with, uh, with most people and in, in just about every, every regard is that, you know, the, the prospect that they might be, be wrong is, is just not even in the realm of possibility in their mind. And, and that's always a fucking problem because you're never going to grow from that for sure. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about um, kind of the the men versus women aspect of of kind of what you uh, deal with and, and teach. Um, you know, to me, there, there's there, there's almost a, a strange I don't know that I'd call it a dichotomy, but but similarly that way where there's certain things about you know the, the male toxicity that that you you hear about or uh, you know masculine uh, you know masculinity being a problem, it being toxic in our society and, and the patriarch quote unquote being a problem and, and all of this other stuff. And I think that um, one of the interesting things about that is that for, for things to shift, it can't be just guys talking about what needs to happen or, or being cut slack or like whatever the group is, whether it's a minority group, you know, a, a sex group, a fucking a religious group, whatever is that, it, it really kind of has to come from the other side mm -hmm. is, is that, you know, for, for the, the toxic masculinity movement to, to get put back in its place, which I, I firmly, firmly fucking believe it needs to. I think that that's one of our society's biggest problems is thinking that masculinity is toxic it is, but, but the, the irony is, is that it really has to come from women. Uh, do you find yourself talking to a lot of women about that type of stuff or, or speaking with, husbands and, and t you know telling them how to interact with their wives as far as stuff like that goes because to me like you and I can sit here and talk about how <laughs> yeah we should be left the fuck alone We're preaching in the choir though but yeah I mean like it, it doesn't really matter if if women or or in whatever group you're talking about doesn't have that that uh, mindset to and push for it then then it's kind of a lost cause to to my to my perspective no I mean you're completely right I was just speaking at, at a men's conference in Colorado last week and we were talking you know, about these, these different ways, like how to build like what we call a foxhole, you know, group of men around you that's cultivating and pushing you to cultivate spiritual, mental, and physical resilience on a daily basis. And the thing is, is one of the easiest ways to destroy a man's momentum in that direction is a nagging wife or a, didn't you just hang out with your friends last month? Like that type of a mindset, right? Yeah. But one of the things that I love talking about with my wife is my wife's a lioness, right? Like she's down, she's down for the cause. She doesn't always understand it, she doesn't understand why I wanted to come in here today, throw on a suit and get attacked by a meat missile, right? That wasn't like something that she yeah. would ever think to do, right? Yeah. But that is that is just something that like, she's down. Okay, cool. Yeah. I'll take video. I'm super nervous about it. Yeah. I hope you don't die, honey. I love you. <laughs> but like, but yeah. she's, she's down even though she doesn't understand it. Yeah. But one of the best ways I've heard it framed, and it was again, you know, John Eldridge, who's a mentor of mine, and he was on my show. I asked him about toxic masculinity, kind of like what you were saying. He's like, look, just because something's dangerous doesn't mean you get rid of it. It means you put it in the hands of someone that knows how to use it. Yeah. Right. So, and he, you know, examples could be medicine is dangerous. Yeah. So you don't just let a seven year old choose what medicine. Is. Almost everything in excess can be dangerous. You right. Know? And yeah. so it's like you don't put a, a, a firearm in the hands of a person that doesn't know how to use it properly. Right. And that's where we get some of those evil people that are using firearms not in the way that they were meant to be used or <laughs> swords or sticks or cars or whatever. Right. But the thing about it is, is, 
the culture is such that things are so easy that we're having to create resistance, yeah. right? Uh, that that gal who I won't even say her name because it's not really worth saying, but that U.S. hammer thrower yeah. that you know refused to turn her, turn towards the flag for the national anthem, and you know talked about all this oppression and systemic racism and all these different things. What she's neglected to do to, in, in any of her follow up interviews is explain how she personally has been oppressed in this country. Yeah. She can't explain that. Yeah. She can explain slavery, which is something that we need to talk about all the time and remind ourselves of the evils of that. She. She can she can explain civil rights and the movements in, in the Deep South and Jim Crow and all that, but what she cannot explain is how she personally has been affected by that. Because we live in this environment where, you know, what's the, the poem that I forget who it's attributed to, but it's like, hard times make strong men, strong men make good times, good times make weak men, weak men make hard times, yeah. right? We're in that paradigm, we're in that yeah. time period now where we have a bunch of weak men, you know, broad stroke, yeah. that are creating these, these hard times for us. Yeah. But it's because in the early 20th century, no one had time to worry about gender. Yeah. No one had time to worry about well, you know, these different things because yeah. there was a war to fight. There was, a, there was an evil atheistic worldview that was manifesting itself overseas that we were afraid was going to you know, yeah. manifest itself here, and we had to go kill it. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not even just in the 20th century. I mean, here, yes. There are places all over the, all over the globe that are still that way. You know, I mean, I can tell yeah. you, go, go to... Uh, you know, parts of, I mean, most of the Philippines or Indonesia, you think they give a fuck about what pronouns you use? They don't because they don't have time to worry about what, what I would consider at this point frivolous shit. It is. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, to me, just, just the fact of, of being able to be offended, uh, and I've said this a, a number of times on this show and a bunch of other ones, is that, that that hands the control of your emotions to somebody else and puts you in a, a position of, of incredible weakness. Yep. You know, and, and that, like, why would you ever put yourself in that fucking position? I, I don't understand it. Um, you know, and so there, there is, is a huge fucking problem with that. And I, I just finished my, my fourth book, uh, which I, I definitely want to send you and, and uh, get your input on. It'll be out in September. Cool. Uh, and it talks uh, so, about some of the things that we've talked about. Uh, it's mostly social stuff and political stuff and, and what have you. But, uh, but it, you know, I, I outline a, a number of things like that that, uh, you know, that, that it kind of identifies, you know, okay, what is the problem, first of all? Like, you've got to understand what, what the, the real systemic problems are, and those are based on data, not on what you think or emotion. And, and that's one of the biggest problems is that some of the things that people think are a big fucking deal actually aren't. Mm -hmm. uh, not not data-wise, they're not. You know, they're emotionally charged, you know, and, that, and that's, you know, problem number one. And step one to fucking things up is make decisions and, and react based yeah. on emotions. Um, you know, but, uh, anyway, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to getting that out soon, but, uh, back to, uh, you know, kind of the question I had, uh, you know, not only do, uh, am I curious about how, how you, uh, talk to men about how they interact to women, but do you ever actually talk to, to women's groups about that? Cause to me that that's probably an even more important component would be to have somebody with your advocacy capabilities, you know, talking to groups of women say, you know, this is how things need to, to sure. need to run in your house. Do you do any of that? So you can only talk to groups you've been invited to talk to. Yeah. And so whenever I, <laughs> turns out so, they haven't fucking yeah, asked turns me. Turns out they haven't called me yet. Yeah. Uh, but like to anyone listening to this, that wants that type of a thing, that's a very fertile, that's very fertile soil for me to come in. Yeah. Right. To, to There's so many, of, well, so many places I can go with that, you know? That. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, we'll back off a little bit. Maybe I'll, I'll use a, a different way of describing it. But um, one thing that's interesting for me, is I will get email from women. Cause when you look at my, you know, the, the stats for my podcast, you know, it's like maybe 90% male listeners, 10% yeah. female listeners. And I thought that was kind of high on the yeah. female side. I thought that was maybe too many. Um, but I will get emails from women that I'll say, what are you saying in your show? Because my husband has made a lot of definitive changes in how he's, mm -hmm. you know, his relationship towards me, his relationship <laughs> towards the kids, things are getting better. And he's, pointing towards this podcast, which again, is kind of cocky to say, but it's like that I'm using their words. And I'm like, uh, hard for me to answer that, ma'am. I'm so glad for this outcome. Perhaps you should give it a listen yourself. And then I will also get women that'll email me and say, yeah, you're, you're kind of talking about, you know, this, this kind of sheepdog mindset for, for men. Is there something like that for women? Do you have a women's podcast? Like, do you have a podcast that you know of that kind of talks about how she, you can be a sheepdog woman and all these different things? And, you know, from a, from a macro sense, it's like, 
I think there is a role for the man and a role for the woman in society and the family and all those different things. And I'm not about to get into an email debate on, yeah. you know, <clears throat> complementarianism or any of those types of things with, with somebody, but there is a thirst out there for it because the people who bear the brunt of actual toxic masculinity, which is not how culture defines it, but actual toxic masculinity, like the aloof man, the unplugged man, like the man who just is a slug sitting around, like super passive, the effeminate weak man. The people that bear the brunt of that are women and children. Yeah. Okay. Those are the people that have to struggle with the results of that effeminacy in a male. Right. Mm -hmm. And I know we're not allowed to use those terms anymore, but in the binary Here world we that we live in, right, we're, we're, we're standing in it right now. But in the zero one binary world that we live in, there is a result to that type of a mindset. Right. And I have, I have personal friends who something went bump in the night and they turned to their wife to go and check it out. Yeah, it's pathetic. And I love these men, right? For a lot of reasons. I'd have like, a hard time loving those guys. But, but it's like, it doesn't make sense to me. Because I understand wiring, and sometimes you have to go against your wiring. And if you're wired to be super aggressive, you know, it doesn't make sense. And if you're wired to be a little bit more, hey, let's kind of figure this out. But to look to your woman to protect you and your multiple children, that doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. But you know what's interesting about that is the, you know, again, they're, they're the shift, and, and again, I think it stems primarily from uh, we, we as a society have been too successful for too long, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and it's, it's actually ruined how things work, you know. Yeah. Um, but there, there's an element of that that, um, that I think, you know, is, is tough to, uh, it's, it's tough to, to combat or, or get back from is that, you know, if you get to a point where, where a society is so, so comfortable to where now like the, the laws of nature and biology are, are up for debate, yeah. uh, you know, then it's like, well, how, how do you, how do you reset that in any way other than just total catastrophe basically? Because uh, again, I mean, I can tell you like there are parts of the, of the world right now where the patriarchy, like for thousands of years, it's been a certain way. Why is that? You know, it's, it's not because people just chose to be that way. And, and I would say, like, for, for any, uh, you know, feminist or, or uh, you know, high-charged high women out there that think that, that there's this, you know, secret fucking men's club that just decides to rule the yes. world, like, let me ask you something. Like, if it's a choice, why don't you do it? Right? Is sure. Like, if you can just decide to run things. Yeah, if you can make 30 more cents per hour, like, yeah. just by changing well, your I, gender, Yeah, I mean, I can, I can tell you as a business owner, that's not the case, because if it was, I'd have all women working for me. Yeah. Right? All businesses would, because they, they'd make way more fucking money. Like, that, that's a bullshit stat, which I, I outline in the book, actually. I did a ton of research on it uh, in conjunction with uh, with the uh, with the uh, ghostwriter to... Uh, to uh, you know, really dive deep and say, okay, th this is a narrative that's pushed. Mm -hmm. Is it actually accurate? The same way, uh, you know, un unarmed, uh, you know, black citizens in the sure. country being shot. I mean, it happened last year, which is the most recent data. Uh, it happened nine times. You know, and five of those nine, they, they were armed right up until the point where where it took place. You know, and right. so like to say that that's a systemic problem based on data, is just factually fucking inaccurate. Right. Uh, the same way saying that women are paid less than men, uh, 30 cents on the dollar, is factually fucking inaccurate. But to me, that, that's half the problem, is there's a narrative pushed by certain media groups, most media groups, that make it very, very difficult. And it, it actually kind of reminds me, unfortunately, of a lot of, of those kind of cookie-cutter Christians that you talk about, mm -hmm. is that you know, they're, never, they're, they're surrounded in an echo chamber where they're never really forced to defend their position ever. You know, nobody ever actually asks them a hard question, like most media groups where, uh, you know, when they're actually put in that position, they sound like bumbling fucking morons yep. because they've, they've never actually had to defend it. And to me, no, nothing will make you either resilient, uh, you know, and, and staunch in, in how you feel about whatever position or make you change your mind than being pushed and, and have people who actually understand uh, you know how to communicate actually actually push you push you on those opinions. But anyway, um, well, one thing you were talking about, like you were talking about the narrative, right? So there's there's a narrative of what the media says, but there's this cloud hanging over society, and the narrative <clears throat> is of victimhood. Yeah. And used to there was no, you know, cultural plaudits that were given towards the person that was trying to be a victim or that was celebrating their victimhood. We celebrated the victors. We celebrated the people that overcame their circumstances, showed resilience in the face of terrible life 
you know, less life things that have happened to them and life circumstances and they bulled their way through. Those are the stories we like now. But now we pre present people <coughs> with a menu of victimhood things that they can choose. So you can choose a victimhood status based on intersectionality. I would like to be, you know, I'm a woman now, or I'm, you know, uh, I'm of this race, or I'm this of an ethnicity. And so I've created this whole amalgam that becomes I'm a victim of, of whatever, right? And now I can point at something and say, those are the people that are oppressing me. Like that's kind of the, the lifestyle, but we're placing value on that. Kind of like the open market places value. What is that microphone worth? It's worth what people are willing to pay for it and up to that point and no more. But in culture, we've inculcated this idea where we're obsessed with these, these ideas. Uh, there's someone named Camille Pagley. I don't know if you've, you've heard that name mm. before. Um, she doesn't have this huge prominent following, and I hope I'm kind of not you know, mis, misguiding you in terms of how she thinks, but she was on the Jordan Peterson podcast years ago, but she was obsessed with like researching the ends of these great civilizations. So, so think Persian Empire, Rome, Greece. And one of her contentions, and again, I hope I'm framing this properly, is that these people groups, towards the end of their people groups, right? Their, their, their reign, their empires, were obsessed with gender and sex. Obsessed with it, right? And history repeats itself, right? But society had become so good for them that they had to create struggle somewhere else. And they started asking these questions that you don't ask when you're fearful of where the next, you know, morsel of food will come from or whether or not the tribe on the other side of the hill is going to come over and attack you. Yeah. And that's kind of where I feel like we're at to 100%. where it's like, you know, you feel like these things are falling apart at the seams and I don't know that there's a glue or duct tape strong enough to kind of get it back together. And, and I'm a little bit, you know, pessimistic by nature, believe it or not. And like, I don't know that there's enough toothpaste to be shoved back in the tube at this point, but the people that are yelling the loudest to try and correct it are the people that are given the smallest microphone. Yeah. And so you do what you can to get these things out there. But even in Michael Knowles, he just wrote, wrote a book about, about language and all these different things, a very conservative book and how people from the left are trying to control language. It didn't, it sold the most copies of any nonfiction book in, in the country this week. Didn't make it on the New York times bestseller list. Yeah. How interesting. Yeah. They're diminishing the size of his microphone. Yeah. And it's only whenever we kind of push back against that and make our voices louder in other ways, do you start to kind of stem that tide a little bit? Yeah. I mean, to me, shy of, not even shy, I think it would take a, a red dawn kind of scenario yeah. for, for our country to, to hit a full reset. I, I just, I think it's like with kids that go off the rails that they need to, or a, a fucking drug addict, like there, there's a certain rock bottom spot that, that, you know, we're going to have to hit before people mm -hmm. realize what's really important and what's just manufactured bullshit. Um, all right. So in terms of, of kind of what, what you do now, can you reduce it to, you, know, you said yourself, you're more of a five bullet point kind of guy, yeah. like, you know, for, for a guy or girl out there listening, what, what is kind of the, the element of, of what you would want to communicate to them to say, you know, here's, here's what to focus on. Yeah. So again, the mission being equipping men to push back darkness, getting them to focus on cultivating spiritual, mental, and physical resilience on a daily basis. Uh, part of that is framing it the way that I did, which is framing it in the terms of resilience and not strength. Because strength is something that wanes, right? So a week ago, <coughs> uh, this guy from the UK, I forget his name, he won the world's strongest man. Well, the day after the world's strongest man competition is over, he's not the strongest man in the world anymore. His body's broken down. He's busted up. Somebody else is stronger than him that day. But he could probably recover and rest and in a week or two come back and be the world's strongest man again. It's that resilience. It's that ability to push through. And so one of the mediums we found that's most appropriate to get that out to people is doing a weekly podcast. So since 2017, we've done at least one episode a week. Now, if there's a terrorist attack or some sort of big news thing that's breaking, you know, we'll, we'll do a special episode drop of some kind. But we don't have a homogenous type of thing that we talk about, right? So sometimes we're going to talk about a big philosophical topic, right? So I did a two-part series on toxic masculinity, right? But then we're going to talk about things that are significant to what's going on at that exact moment right? Maybe it, maybe it is an attack. Maybe it's something that happened in the news. You know, with the George Floyd stuff that went down last year, I took two months before I said a word about it on the show because I wanted to research. I wanted to think through my philosophy. I wanted to hear opinions that I kind of bristled with, opinions that I agreed with, and kind of formulate it into an episode. That episode turned into three episodes, turned into a few follow-up episodes on race in America. And so the thing I guess that I would want to communicate to the audience is we are not afraid to go into the topics that a lot of other people are afraid to go into, okay? Mm -hmm. 
I drew a dividing line on my podcast pretty easy, pretty early on with episode four. It's called Pussies in the Pews. And I basically gave my philosophy. Were you talking about women? <laughs> no. I'm talking about these effeminate men who we would colloquially call a pussy and say that there's an epidemic of these types of men in churches. And that is affecting how people see Christ. It's affecting all these things. When you overemphasize the Lamb of God and you never mention the Lion of Judah, you're emphasizing the effeminate part or the feminine part of someone's personality and not the masculine part. Yeah. Um, and so I, I'm okay with those dividing lines, not being crass for crass sake, but there are, there are ministries out there. There are churches, there are pastors, there are all these different people that won't wade into the culture war, yeah. right? And I have a lot of deep and abiding respect for some of these organ, organizations and the decision that they've made. But I think that the battle, like, you know, the battlefront has changed <laughs> for the most part. You can't fight it from the pulpit with a bunch of people, like you said, that, you know, we're in our silo and we're all thinking the same thing. In order to push back on darkness, you have to leave the confines of the building that yeah. you live in, right? The church is a body of people, not a building, right? And so we want to equip men with the necessary arguments and the necessary data and the necessary, you know, our ways of articulating a point of view that is conducive to being able to push back on yeah. where they need to push back. No, I, I agree. And I'm, you know, not to make it uh, too heavy on the jujitsu reference, but again, it just, it reminds me of, of the, the, the very, very small calculated increases uh, in, in pressure and body position superiority is that, right. is that that to me, that's what's happening. And, and the problem is, is that most people are letting, well, I'll give them this little bit and this little bit, and I'm not going to fight this and I'm not going to, you know, and, and before you know it, you're completely fucked, you know, yeah. and, and that's what's happening is that people aren't willing to, to fight the little naggy battles uh, at first to keep the culture warriors at, at bay. And, and, uh, and this is, you know, the, the byproduct of it is that you see now we have a society that culturally has shifted massively in the last 20 years. I mean, you know, like, are you, do you watch the office? Yeah. Yeah. My wife and I love it. You know, I mean, to me like that, that show is, is a, a stark fucking reminder of, of how far this country has, has fallen. Yeah. The jokes a, that they a, said would just no, I mean, would never I, go over. Yeah, honestly, like I'm surprised it's still on. I'm, I'm surprised because yeah. I mean, it was on Netflix. I think it's on Amazon now or, or maybe vice versa, but I'm, I'm especially with, with Hollywood being the way that they are about canceling people for tweeting something fucking nine years ago or whatever. Like, I don't know how the fucking show is still on, honestly, yeah. but um, you know, there, there's, I think it's, it might be the first season there's a diversity day episode. That may be the first episode. No, I know it's, it's one of the first okay. ones, but um, there's another one called gay witch hunt that, uh, <laughs> yeah. that like, it's just, you know, same with the Chappelle show. I mean, some of the old Saturday night live stuff. I mean, it's just like when you watch that and think that, that, that that's what was on TV and it was funny and nobody, you know, made, made a, an issue or had heartburn about it or even take it, you know, a little further back. I mean, watch blazing saddles. You know, I mean, yeah. shit like shit like that. And, and that wasn't that long ago, you know, in the grand scheme of things, especially like The Office. I mean, that was 15, 10, 15 years ago. And, and things are, are so fucking crazy now to where the thought of something like that coming on. I mean, no, no studio would would ever dare touch something oh. like that. Um, you know, and again, I, I don't know how you fucking combat that at this point. Like, uh, you know, I, I don't see. I, I don't see how you get past it. I, I'm curious from your perspective in terms of whether it's the podcast or speaking engagements, I mean, for, for the, any audience member that has that question of, of saying, Hey Kyle, how, how do we fucking change this? Like, yeah. how, how do you beat it? The, the simple way to answer that is be willing to say no mm -hmm. and to mean it. Right. So your school board, you know, they're, they're trying to figure out whether or not they uh, are going to bring in critical race theory as part of the history yeah. teaching for, you know, five-year-olds, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, whatever. The answer is no. Yeah. And it's a no with a period after it. Right. This is not a discussion anymore. I think this was in Arizona. There was a, a group of parents that came in because maybe they were doing some you know weird crap with with COVID and whatever. And they came in and they demanded the resignation, you know, forcefully but nonviolently. They demanded the resignation of every single one of the school board members, which they eventually got. They elected new school board members right then and there, and their kids went back to school. Hmm. Right? Where was this at? This was somewhere in Arizona, and so like I believe it was Arizona, but like they. They basically said, the answer is no. And we were asleep at the wheel and that's our fault. 
y'all aren't, you don't have this job anymore. And it wasn't a violent overthrow. There were no yeah. threats made that I know of that I'm aware of. And so I encourage people, one of the ways that you push back is by standing your ground. This sounds so stupid that I have to even say it. But, you know, for instance, if you want your, your pastor to start talking about BLM, or start talking about some of these dangerous worldviews and ideologies, or talking about being pro-life and anti-abortion and those different things. You go to your pastor who is scared to piss off the flock, right? Because, you know, part of the salary and part of how we keep the lights on at the church is these people give us money and, you know, we pay for everything and that, that's how it works. You don't want to piss off your flock, right? You say, pastor, if you talk about this issue, I got your back. I will stand in front of you. I will take some of the heat. I will take some of the arrows, but people need to hear from you. Because you're going to have to give an account someday for how you shepherded your flock. I'm not. Have you had those conversations with? Absolutely. Absolutely. And the thing is, is it's, it's almost like an immediate like paradigm shift for these people. They're like, oh, I can say this and I won't die. Yeah. Right? And making yourself uncancelable, part, part of that is making yourself undeniable. Right? Joe Rogan can't be canceled because he's undeniable, right? He gets over a, you know, a billion listens to his podcast a year, so he can't be canceled. But some of the best advice Jordan Peterson gave on the subject, who he's basically canceled every couple of weeks, is he said, when something goes wrong and people freak out, make sure that you're in the right. Check with your, your people, your group. Make sure that what you said and did is up to your standards and, and is factually correct. Let the fire and let everything burn for two weeks and get back, get back to work. Yeah. Don't allow them to cancel you. So the, the thing I told people, especially during all the black lives matter stuff is I said, you can never bow low enough to the mob. You can never apologize loud enough to the mob. Mm -hmm. They won't accept it. And we're seeing that now we have these people who are woke, who posted the black square on Twitter and, you know, they celebrate every single, you know, woke holiday and celebrate all these woke heroes and then they find an old tweet or an old comment or an old joke that they laughed at, or they found themselves on the wrong side of an issue that has just been changed, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the foundation of this issue just changed and they're on the wrong side of it. And now they're canceled and they just, oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Please accept me back into the fold. But yeah. if you look at the totalitarian regimes of the 20th century, Stalin's, <laughs> you know, Soviet Union, you look at Hitler and you look at Mussolini, you look at these types of people, Pol Pot, Mao, you can't apologize enough to live. Yeah. They can't allow you to have your life because you are no longer available to them. You're no longer viable to be a part of the special elect group anymore. <clears throat> yeah. And so that, that's the way that you push back because you push back actively. And I've had people that have been very disappointed in some of my opinions and how I've described them and all that, but I have that standard in my brain. If I am factually correct on the things that are factual, and if I'm still comfortable with my opinion and my philosophy on the issue... Thank you so much for your feedback. I would like to invite you to no longer listen to my show. I would like to invite you to no longer come to my speeches. I would like to invite you to do those things. There are a lot of people out there that aren't going to offend your sensibilities. Don't allow me to continue to do that to you and don't, move on. And don't allow me to con control your emotions any further. Yeah, right? sure. If yeah. you can't control them and if I'm going to affect you in that yeah. much of a way, then take that out. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, you see it a lot in, in politics uh, and in, in a lot of walks of life, but to me, especially politics, because it's so visible, uh, you know, is, is that most politicians, when they, they get in front of a, of a gotcha moment, that's exactly what they do. They start tap dancing and apologizing. And, and yeah. at that point, you know, again, we'll, we'll bring another dog training reference in, is that, you know, when you're in the bite suit, like if you're legitimately fucking nervous and scared of the dog, the dog knows that. And it's not mm -hmm. that he can smell it. Uh, you know, that's a big misnomer that, uh, that I think a lot of people assume that, you know, dogs can quote unquote smell fear. Uh, while yes, there, there are, uh, mechanisms within your body that, that from a hormonal standpoint change, uh, you know, pheromones and, and the way that your body odor smells in certain instances and et cetera. Does that exist? Yes, it does. However, uh, 99% of a dog's perception as to whether or not you're scared, aggressive, angry, happy, sad, you know, whatever it is, is your body language is that, you know, if you think about, um, Think about, you know, if you and I have never met, but you see me walking across a fucking Walmart parking lot and I'm having the worst, worst fucking day of my life, you're going to pick up on that. Yeah. Well, the same token, if I just won the fucking lottery, you're going to pick up on that also, you know. Now, if you think about just in the last couple hours that we've been sitting here, how much information we've exchanged verbally, you know, has body language played a role in, in how we've communicated? Yes, but very, very little. Yeah. Now, imagine a dog, right? So if, if it's that easy for human beings to pick up 
the nuance of body language and understand what's happening, even though we're as verbal as we are. Now imagine a dog that is not verbal at all. And, and now imagine the amount of information that's exchanged in body language. It's, it's fucking massive. Like it, it reminds me of the, of, of hearing you or, or anybody uh, in a similar fashion speak about afterlife or God. Is it like you, you can't even begin to wrap your mind around or around what, what that is for them to live the way that they live. And so what that means is that you've got to be so hyper vigilant of, uh, of your body language when you're interacting with them. But, uh, I got so off tangent, I lost my fucking train of thought. But uh, well, let, me, let me keep the tangent going because you, you mentioned something about, about being vigilant and like watching people in the parking lot. Like I think there's kind of a through point for that, that mindset as well. So I read a book back in the day. I can't, uh, Left of Bang, it was basically talking about always being in like code yellow or something. So it's like constantly be looking around. Don't be the paranoid guy. Yeah. It's like, oh, you know, I got that guy looks like he has a gun in his car. Like, oh, you know, like you don't have to be that person. But always be ready because, I mean, whoever said it, you know, you fall to the, the level of your training. Yeah. You know, you don't ascend you don't, to the moment, especially yeah. big guys, especially with jujitsu. They just assume, I don't need to train. I'm huge, right? Like, if I ever get in a fight, like, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm a massive human being. Hulk and then you smash. watch, you know, this Hulk get smashed by a 135-pound dude. And it's yeah. just like, all right, that's just kind of how it goes. Yeah. But most people, again, I've said it a hundred times. Here's your drinking game. Sleep at the wheel. They're not paying attention to the guy in the parking lot that doesn't look like he should be there. Yeah. They're not paying attention to the guy or gal that's walking into the school that's willing to do damage because there are signs all over the place. Yeah. And we're really, really focused on where our eyes are, right? As as seeing beings. But we're all we're always, you know, looking here. We're yeah. looking at our phones. Like we're paying attention to what's right immediately in front of us. And I think that's where you you lose a lot of that. So it's good to even like read your books or hear you talk about dog training because it's like those dogs have things that they do that are just better because genetically they're better and biologically they're better at doing that than a human being. Yeah. But there are things that you can take and that you can pick up on. Like a quick scan of the parking lot before you walk in, you may have identified a threat, yeah. a threat that you're just like, I'm going to continue to pay attention here. But then again, are you trained to interject in that type of a setting? Because kind of the next part of pushing back darkness is, are you physically capable of taking care of darkness, yeah. right? So I, I tell people, hey, you need to train jiu-jitsu. You need to train Muay Thai, wrestling, Western boxing. Like, you need to be ready to get in a fight. Well, then I run into this person that's, you know, lifelong NRA member. They're like, I always got my gun on me. What do I need to get in a fight for? I was like, what if you get in a fight at an airport, yeah. right? You ever got in a fight at a post office, like yeah. where you, somewhere where you can't have your gun or you didn't have it on you yeah. that day? Most people just, I mean, they're just completely oblivious yeah. to those yeah. things. I mean, it, it's a tool the same way. Jiu-jitsu is a tool the same way. Yep. Uh, you know, knife fighting is a tool the same way. Defensive driving is a fucking tool. I mean, to me, I view security like an onion is that you want, you know, as many or cold weather is that you want as many layers as possible. Like I, I don't want to rely on one single thing. I want a good dog that'll fuck somebody up. You know, I, I want to stay sharp on my pistol skills. I want to fucking know how to roll with people. I, I want to know how to strike people. I need, need to be situationally aware. If you have all of those things, you know, in, in your uh, skill set, inherently you're going to be far more better off than if you're just really good at, at one thing and, and super one dimensional that way. But, um, in terms of, of kind of what you, you offer beyond, um, you know, the, the podcast itself, uh, what's kind of the, the gist of, of the speaking engagements? Are they, do you have like almost, you know, pre done presentations that you do or, or is it like, Oh, this group's inviting me. And so I'm tailoring each presentation to that or, or how does that work? So a little bit of both. So I do have some canned talks. And so like, you know, again, I'm, I'm very passionate about the abortion issue. Um, and the let's talk, let's that's talk about that. Well, yeah, I mean, let, let's go there, but, and, you know, we'll, we'll circle back to it, but you know, I have, I don't just think it's okay to be pro-life. I think you should be able to defend it. And so uh, I did a podcast years ago called uh, answering 17 pro abortion arguments, right? If someone says this, what do you say, right? Mm -hmm. And so I can kind of come and do kind of that pro-life talk that isn't just rah-rah, it's more practical, right? Um, the one that I just did in Colorado was the new devotional I just released. It's a seven-day devotional called How to Build a Godly and Manly Foxhole, right? So using overt militaristic language in a non-militaristic setting to basically say, there are seven questions that every man needs to kind of answer. And so I help them answer them. And so the seven questions are, you know, what is a godly man? What is a manly man? Can you be both godly and manly? Was Jesus a manly man? What is a foxhole? Why does every man need a foxhole? And the last one is how do you build and maintain a foxhole? And so a foxhole is just 
uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's a group of men that are constantly pushing each other to cultivate spiritual, mental, and physical resilience on a daily basis. It's the difference between having a bunch of 6 p.m. friends and a bunch of 3 a.m. friends. 6 p.m. friends will help you. They'll help you move stuff. They'll help you at the house till about 6 p.m. But if you call them at 3 o'clock in the morning and everything's falling apart, they're not available to you, right? They're not, I'm on my way friends. They're just, hey, I kind of like you kind of friends. So I, I have some of those canned speeches, but if, if a church or an organization or a men's group or a business or something, if they have something specific that they want me to discuss, I'm a very extemporaneous speaker. It's like, oh, wait, I can't just go off my notes. I'd rather not go on my notes. Tell me what these people need. And I, I got the opportunity with this group in Colorado to spend some time with the men and the young men in this community before I went up and spoke in front of them. And I was able to relate a lot of the things that I had noticed and picked up on in what I was saying and kind of work that in. But that's that's... That's the way that I like to present is I don't like to give the same presentation twice, but there are points that I'm going to hit and I want to make sure that that happens. And different groups pick up on different things. Like this group, they zeroed in on was Jesus a manly man. Out of the seven topics that I went over over two hours, whoop, that was the one. Is it a CrossFit group or what? No, no, not at all. <laughs> no, but like, yeah. How much could Jesus bench? Yeah, Let's exactly. Be but like, that's the thing is that kind of goes back to what we were saying is like, you know, the modern church has given us so much lamb of God. They almost give us no lion yeah. of Judah. Yeah. And, and every time you see Jesus depicted in film or in pictures, he looks like me with long hair. It's like he was a Middle Eastern Jew yeah. carpenter right? This was a fairly rough dude. And like, he wasn't constantly walking around kissing a lamb. Yeah. Like that just wasn't who he is. And like, yeah, in bar fights, you know, it's like, in dude, like, and I went through that. It's like, yeah. I was like, let's go to scripture and figure out if we can, you know, tell whether or not Jesus was a manly man. And when he cleared the temple, like that was premeditated aggression and it was sustained aggression. So is that the answer to my next question? What's the most gangster thing Jesus ever did? Dude, that that's well, okay. So he cast out a demon with his voice only. So that's pretty gangster, right? Yeah. He told a dead guy to not be dead anymore, and it worked, right? Lazarus, like, hey, yeah. get out of there, right? So that, that's pretty gangster. But the reason why I love him clearing the temple, I love that so much, is, and I kind of mentioned it earlier. Um, we have from Scripture, that, that, script, that story is like four or five lines. Yeah. It's four or five verses. But there's so much packed into it because he shows up he sees that the temple is full of money changers and people, you know, exchanging money in, in God's house, his dad's house, right? We have no evidence to show that Jesus walked into that situation with a whip on his hip. None. He left, got a whip or made a whip and came back. So premeditated aggression, right? Also, it was sustained aggression, right? Because they didn't say it was a table with money on it that he turned over. Tables, oxen and sheep and, and pigeons that needed to be cleared out, right? So it was sustained aggression, but also it was intimidating aggression because we have no evidence to suggest that anyone tried to stop him. Mm -hmm. And so I, like when I talk about it in groups, you know, you got all these men in this, in this room or whatever, and I say, imagine that a man that you don't know busts into this room, starts throwing tables and chairs and clearing you guys out with a whip. Imagine how the look that would have to be in that guy's eye for none of you to think, we got to stop this because yeah. for a lot of my friends, we've been training for that our whole lives, right? Like, dude, yeah. it's finally happening. I can yeah. do this and not go to jail. This is great. But in that scenario, that's the line of Judah, yeah. right? That's not the guy walking <clears throat> around prancing and giving everyone kisses on the tips of their nose, right? Yeah. That's the guy who comes back on a white horse with a tattoo on his leg that says yeah. Lord of Lords <laughs> with his robe dipped in blood. So yeah. like that, that's kind of the thing, but most churches don't frame God in that way. And, and you can swing the pendulum too far over to the, to the line of Judah side. Sure. And I tell people like, no, he's 100% lamb of God, 100% line of Judah. We just got to like, you know, blow the dust and dirt off the line of Judah and talk about it more. Yeah, I dig it. Um, all right, going to, uh, going to abortion, right? So it's a, a thing you're, you're more passionate about or, or you, you find yourself speaking a lot about. Yeah. What, uh, give, give me the rundown on, on that, I guess. Yeah, so... Uh, it's not something that I've ever had to deal with. It's not something that's like, oh, you know, I paid for an abortion and now I'm, I'm never going to let that happen again. But it's a unique social issue in that it's legal in this country by writ of a Supreme Court decision, but not a legal mandate. And most people don't know that. So most people don't know the history of Roe v. Wade and all that. And, you know, there's more technical people that can break it down in, in a better way than I do. But the pro-life issue is mainly a thing on the right, there's no prominent Democrat or leftist that is pro-life. There, there are none. You can't find one. Um, but the thing that I was astonished by is that no one can give an answer to why pro-abortion arguments are stupid. 
So the one I brought up earlier, well, it's her body. You can't tell her what to do with her body. And it's like, like hell I can't. Because guess what? As we were driving in today, if my wife decided at the stoplight to hop out, take all her clothes off and take running and take off running down Main Street and a police officer picks her up for that and puts her in the back of the car, her argument can't be my body, my choice, right? Mm-hmm. Right? If I start swinging my arms around in a big old empty room and I'm not hitting anybody, right? My body, my choice. But the moment my arm smacks into your face, now we have an issue. I can apologize or I can keep doing it. And your response would be warranted and a legal you know, person of the law, a person of, of the shield would be able to kind of take me down for, for doing that type of a thing. But people don't understand that biologically speaking, not using the Bible, even though I can, using biology, that being that is growing inside of her is not her. It has its own DNA, has its own blood, has its own everything. How tall that kid's going to be, mm-hmm. their, their level of melanin, the shape of their nose, all that is written into them the moment they become a one-celled zygote, right? I mean... I mean, at, at the risk of, of getting too technical, obviously, during the pregnancy and how they, they feed themselves and take care of themselves is, is going to play a role in that. But I, I see your, your point 100%. Yeah. Well, and even the same thing, like to say that the woman has no role would, would be disingenuous, but it's like it's inside her body. The baby is not inside her body. It is not her body. Yeah. And I know people think that's unfair. Why can't a man carry a baby and all those different things? But yeah. again, if I shove my finger up your nose... I'm inside your body, right? Like you don't now get to decide whether or not I live or die. Yeah. And then you start getting into the other arguments about, you know, basically, you know, geometry or not geometry, but like geographically, where does the baby reside, right? People think the vaginal canal confers some sort of a personhood that right before the vaginal canal, we can kill it and it's moral and okay. But on the other side of the vaginal canal, somehow if I put a suction tube into the back of their brain and suck their brains out and collapse their skull, that now that's murder. Most of the worldviews and most of the arguments that come from pro-abortion people, like they, they, don't, they don't stand up to the sniff test, to the smell test. They, they fall apart based on logic, based on science, and it's just most people aren't willing to give answers for that. They're just uncomfortable with it. Yeah. I, you know, for, for me personally, it, it's, uh, it's no doubt a tough one. You know, um, I can see both sides to it. On the same token, I, you know, I, I take um, a, a pretty hands-off libertarian viewpoint on most things, not all things, but most mm-hmm. things, uh, especially socially. And, and, you know, while I'm sure there's a lot of people that don't consider abortion a social issue. Uh, I do, uh, yeah. j- just in that I think anything that, that has the ability to divide our society on sex lines, party lines, political lines, cultural lines, uh, to me seems like it checks all the boxes for, for a social issue. And, and my take, you know, I think is that, like, do I like the concept of it? No, I don't. Uh, you know, do I think that it's a fucking good deal? No, I think it sucks. Uh, but I also think just for me, like, I don't like people telling me what the fuck to do uh, about anything, really. Uh, I mean, hence why I'm not in the military anymore. And then I run my own business and don't work for anybody is is that I just, you know, I look at it as, is not even the, my body, my choice thing. Cause I I don't like that either. I mean, there's too many other examples where that's not the case. You you provided a few, I mean, vaccines is another one, Uh, you know, whether it's Corona or, or any of the other ones that you're required before you can do certain things or, I mean, there's, there's tons of examples of, of where, you know, you, you are mandated and forced to do certain things uh, if you want to do other things or, or what have you. But uh, I think at a root level, it's just I, I look at it very simply is that I think everybody should be able to do, you know, what they want. And I know that, that that's a lot of gray area there. It's really the only place where that's the case. I feel the same way about the, about the man, too, is that, you know, for women that say it's my body, it's my choice you don't get any fucking say in that. I think that's bullshit too. I think especially when, if you bring that child to term and, and then it's, it's a birthed, uh, now that man also doesn't have a choice. Like if, if you're going to say you don't get to decide, you, you know, you play no role in this decision. Well, you shouldn't be able to come after him for child support either. Sure. Like if a guy's like, people hate that argument, but it's true. Yeah. It's like, uh, you know, Hey, I, I can't, I, I don't want this kid. It was a fucking mistake. I can't afford it. I'm not, not in the right place. I, I know I'm not, you know, where I need to be to be, you know, a, a good father to this child right now. I can't do it. And they're like, yeah, tough shit. And you have to fucking pay me half. You're like, no, it's bullshit. Um, you know, but anyway, not to, not to get too fucking distracted from it, but I just think, you know, on the abortion front, that, that, that's my take on it is that like, I, I, I'm not a fan of it. Uh, I've never been in a position where, uh, where, where I've had to have that either, uh, or, or have been faced with that decision, I guess maybe is a better way to put it. 
um, of, of whether or not that that's the case. And I think, you know, there's some circumstances where it probably makes more sense to, to consider it. There's some where, where maybe not some of its personal responsibility is that, uh, you know, sex is primarily a, a, a reward uh, in most people's minds and, and, a, and an impulse decision in a lot of, in a lot of instances where abortion becomes, uh, you know, part of the conversation is that, is that, you know, the, the sex act that led to that was, was because it was something totally off the cuff and not planned and whatever. And that's, that's an impulse control right. issue and, and a responsibility issue that, uh, that maybe you should take responsibility for. But, but I can see the other side too. And that it's like when you force people, uh, you know, to have a child and either give it up for adoption or, or make them be the parents or whatever. I, I don't think that that's a very good answer either. I, I just don't, um, you know, so, and I know there's a lot of other resources that, you know, maybe like, again, you give it up for adoption or somebody else helps you out or whatever. It's just, I think ultimately at the end of the day, my position is that, you know, a, a to each their own, if you will, if, if I, I still don't think it should be illegal. I think like with a lot of things, people are still going to do it. Um, and, and I'd rather uh, it, it be done in a manner where it's, it's at least as safe as possible, I guess. I don't know. Uh, like I said, I, I see both sides. It's a tough tough, uh, subject to tackle, you know, whether it's when, when it actually becomes a, a being, is it, is it the, the instant, uh, it, it's conceptualized, is it, you know, at, at a certain point, fuck, I don't know, you know, um, that, that's my take on it, but. Well, even the, even the pro-life side, I feel like the pro-life side does a few things wrong. Uh, number one, they, they overcomplicate the pro-life argument. And then also I would say they, they probably don't push hard enough in certain areas. So the pro-life argument essentially <clears throat> is a human being in the womb is a human the next step is basically it is immoral to end the life of an innocent human. Thus, abortion is wrong, right? So that, that's kind of the easiest way to say it. Mm -hmm. And the other side is, is, is not knowing where to push, right? So again, I, I, I kind of, as people throw arguments out is kind of where I will respond. And I typically respond with questions, right? So, you know, I, I won't just say, well, this is what it says and this is what we should do. It's I'll respond with questions. And if they answer those questions, honestly, it'll destroy the argument. And so... With, with people not pushing in, in the correct areas. So one of those things would be like, okay, well, it's not even viable. It can't live outside the womb right now. So it's okay to kill it, right? Well, then you have to make that same argument for a human being that exists geographically outside the womb, right? Because there are people that are being kept alive right now by machines, right? Mm -hmm. You know who's also not viable? My 14-month-old son. Because if I left him in the middle of the floor and never came back, he would die unless another human, an adult, came and interceded in that type of a setting. And so a lot of those times, those, those arguments, they just, they're, they're found wanting, but the people that are in power, right? The pro-abortion people, people in the media that love abortion, it's like their holy sacrament. They have the arguments ready to go, and most people can't go more than two layers deep. But where my libertinar like libertinism or whatever, where that ends is whenever you're taking an innocent life. That is the line that I will draw unapologetically to be like, I agree with you. Live and let live, believe what you want to believe, do what you want to do, but you can't kill that baby. And in this country, there are actually way more abortion or uh, way more pregnancy resource centers than there are abortion centers. And there's this, there's this fallacy that there aren't enough adoptive parents to take these babies and, oh, you only care about them until they're born and then you don't care about them anymore. They're straw men that people build up of pro-lifers using words that have been said by idiots. And, and that's kind of how they, they build their worldview. But again, it's kind of the same thing where like, that requires a whole lot more conversating and a whole lot more thinking that people are just unwilling to do. Yeah. They will read or listen, read two pages or listen to five minutes of something. They flip a coin. They're like, okay, I guess I'm pro-life. Okay, I guess I'm pro-choice without really digging down into what it means. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's one of the biggest problems with, with most uh, societal issues that are hotbed divisive problems in our country is where it's exactly that. It's that well, I'm I'm a Republican, and Republicans think this, so yep. this is what I think. There you go. Same same thing on the Democratic side. Same thing even on the Libertarian side. But I think the the one thing where I would I would maybe uh, exclude Libertarianism is is that it's it's more of a hey, I just don't give a fuck, you know, kind of mentality in a, in a good way in most ways. I think for sure there is some danger in in being apathetic towards certain things. Uh, but you know, again, I guess you know, so, so for me, like. I'm not trying to argue it one way or the other. You know, like I said, I, I see both sides. I think it's a, it's a tough subject. I don't envy, uh, you know, any, anybody in the position where, where they're thinking about that. I can, I can only assume that 
in 99.9% of the cases, like the, the woman or the couple or, or you know, whoever's making that ultimate decision, whether it's collectively or singularly, is, is that they're probably not happy about it. Uh, you know, it's probably a hard decision for them to make, one that I certainly don't envy. Um, you know, but I also think ultimately is that, you know, where, where I guess I would, if you want to call it draw on the line, is that, you know, if, if you're expected to, to be responsible for that, to me, that that's where where it gets tricky. You know, is tricky that, is the right word for sure. Is that you know, like if 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 I'm going to be held accountable for this thing, then, then I should also be able to to get rid of it. You yeah. know, for for lack of of more eloquent fucking phrases, is that uh, you know now where where I think that's the most tricky is that okay, okay, well, there's there's adoption centers, there's you know foster, yeah. blah blah blah, but. But I also think, you know, just, just again, like to, to, to have to pick one side or the other and not waffle and play fucking Switzerland riding the fence line is, is that I just think, you know, like if, it, if, if you're on the hook for the responsibility, it's growing inside you, you ought to ultimately be able to, to make that decision. That, that's how I view it. You know? Yeah, but, and, and again, there, there are certain things that you, you can just talk about for a short while and not really, really shift people and move. Uh, you brought up like 99.9% of these people, this is kind of their worldview and this is kind of what they do. There's also a misnomer for a lot of people that, in terms of the reasons given for an abortion. Mm -hmm. So what I'm leaving off the table in this part of the discussion is the emotions involved and the regret involved that a lot of women feel after they've had an abortion. But overwhelmingly, the reasons given for abortion come down to convenience. Yeah, It's not a good time for me. I, I have to finish school. I don't know who the dad is. Uh, I don't have enough money. It's convenience-based things. Yeah. But a lot of people love to hang their hats on the rape and incest, which is yeah. well less than 1% yeah. of all abortions, or uh, the <laughs> Depending on the state, maybe. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But then, and I'm, also ki I'm kidding, West mother. Virginia. Yeah. <laughs> hey, we love you, West Virginia. But, um, you know, they, they talk about the health of the mother, which is another yeah. misnomer, because you never have to actively kill one human in order to save the other. Yeah. There was in, I think it was in the UK, there was a woman who had needed some sort of like abdom abdominal surgery. I think she may have had cancer or something. They removed the womb from her belly, set it aside, did her surgery, put the womb back, stitched her up. Baby's alive and well today, right? They didn't have to dismember the baby. They didn't have to reach up, cut the back of the neck, you know, put a suction tube in there and suck the brains out and then pull the baby out in pieces in order for the woman to live. There, as, as we get better and better at medicine and, and hospitalization and clinical techniques and surgical techniques, the age of viability will continue to go down. There are babies born at 21 weeks that are walking around alive today with no issues. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of where we, we get into, as a society, we've kind of made some agreements with each other that certain things are wrong yeah. almost always. So raping a minor, right? Maybe until... The next few years when the transgender argument turns into the pedophilic argument where it's like, hey, if a seven-year-old can choose their gender, why mm. can't they choose their sexual partner? But as of right now, yeah. if a 30-year-old man enters into a sexual relationship with a minor, societally, we say that that is wrong. Yeah. And so I think it's almost indicative of a, of a sickness in society, a level of depravity to where people aren't, aren't in the middle-ish, aren't libertarian-ish. They're way on the other side. Like there is no issue here. There's nothing to see here. Yeah. This this is a major major sickness. Yeah, I agree. I, and and you know, again, to play devil's advocate, I think you know one one of the problems with and this is on both sides, but you know, since we're talking about uh, you know the the justification of of not having abortions, uh, is that you know there's a lot of emotion based arguments there. Is yeah. it, is that they're angry about babies being you know it. it because you, you can pluck those heartstrings the, the same way as that, you know, when you flash pictures of brains being sucked out and skulls yep. being, you know, or using a fucking rusty coat hanger in, the, in some back. It's easy out, to like, get their attention. It's, it's easy to get pissed off and think yep. that's fucking bullshit. And that should be, you know, it, it's police brutality. It's the five second clip. It, it's not the two hours before that where the dude broke three officers' jaws and ran over five kids. You know, it's just nine seconds of him getting the fuck beat out of him on the side of the road. Yep. And now everybody wants to to defund the police. And so I, I, I can see that on both sides too. I, I do, uh, I guess, like, or, or can appreciate, maybe didn't think of, of it from the perspective that you just brought up, um, you know, in, in terms of, of the convenience aspect, Yeah. you know, is, is that there's a lot of things in our society where, yeah, it'd be way more convenient to not pay my fucking taxes, but go. guess what? I still have to. There are consequences. Uh, you, you know, and, and there's a lot of things that you could put into that same category. So I, I do see that point. I think that's exceptionally valid also. Uh, again, one that I, I never really considered. 
I, you know, so, you know, again, I, I don't have, uh, you know, the answer other than that I, I ultimately just think, you know, I, I still still believe, though, that, you know, if, if it's their if it's their call, they ought to be able to do do what they want. You know, I think there's a lot of bullshit on both sides, but that's that's just how I view it. Uh, from from my perspective on that, what what would you say to somebody that that takes that route? Hey, you know, with with those people, like I, I'm a live and let live person in a lot of ways, but I do think it's interesting that societally we're still talking about this because one of the I, for, I forgot the name of uh, of the Supreme Court justice when they wrote the majority opinion to Roe v. Wade back in the 70s, they thought that ended the discussion about abortion. They thought that was it, right? Okay, this is settled. No reason to talk about it. But here we are in 2021, and we're still talking about it vehemently yeah. and heatedly, right? But to a degree, I think an industry has been created on both sides around this issue, right? And this, it sucks to admit, but I believe it with all my heart. We know about the pro-abortion side of the industry, right? Planned Parenthood is the biggest boogeyman. They kill about 300,000 babies in the womb a year. As a country, we would kill about a million. Worldwide, we kill over 50 million babies a year with abortion, right? There is an industry to it. Planned Parenthood doesn't make money off pap smears. They make money off of baby parts, right? Like whether they're selling them actively or just sucking them out for the reason of convenience. However, and I hate this, when you go back to 2016 through 2018, Donald Trump's in the White House on a very pro-abortion you know, mindset and ticket, Although I don't believe he is pro-abortion in his heart, that he actually believes in the, or sorry, pro-life in his heart, right? I think I said pro-abortion, I meant pro-life, very, very pro-life administration. He acted in a very pro-life manner, right? But Donald Trump's in the White House with Mike Pence underneath him. And you have Congress, complete control of Congress for two years. And funding for Planned Parenthood actually went up. Now that's interesting because you have complete control at this moment and you've been giving red meat to your followers at rallies for months at this point, talking about the pro-life issue. And we're all behind you, right? And I don't care what you feel personally. I care what you do publicly, right? When it comes to that issue. And that disappointed me. And I chewed on it, I chewed on it, I chewed on it. And I don't know if somebody said it or if it just occurred to me. I honestly don't. There's a pro-life industry as well. To where if all of a sudden Roe v. Wade is thrown out for the horrible jurisprudence that was decided in that case... And it was outlawed in every single state. And abortion went from a million children a year in the United States to a few dozen little pockets of evil people doing it behind the scenes at clinics, you know, in back alleys, all the stuff that we were told about. All those pro-life people don't have anything to compete against anymore. They don't have anything for you to pay them 10 grand to come and speak at your conference against anymore. Yeah. The issue is now settled. Yeah. And so in order to protect their jobs, they can't ever have full winning, right? They can't win fully on the issue. Same people, if you want to swing it back to the left before all your right-wing listeners get mad at me, people on the left, if we really do defund the police completely and we do enter into this utopia, right? That, that this, this great area where we all live in accordance with our purpose and everything's beautiful, there's nothing for them to do anymore. Black Lives Matter, if, 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 if the number was zero, of unarmed black men killed by police, if it was zero every single year for the next 10 years, no one gives money to Black Lives Matter. They don't have a platform anymore. And so that's the thing that drives me nuts. I think the pro-life thing, I think there's, there's some legit people. Lila Rose, I'll mention her by name in live action. I think they're legit. But I think there's a bunch of fakers just making money. Yeah, it's, so it's the same thing. I've, I've uh, talked about this a number of times. I won't go full full blown into it for those that have already heard it, but uh, shelters. I actually mentioned it on the Uninfluenced podcast that I do for those of you assholes listening, uh, uninfluenced, uh, the other show that I do weekly uh, with my buddy Matt, uh, uninfluenced podcast. Uh, we talk about mostly talking shit. Uh, we talk about motorcycles and cars and politics and ju- and just fuck with each other. But uh, at any rate, I uh, I went into it uh, pretty heavy this last week on that. But it's the same thing: is that you know if, if a, a a rescue or, or an animal control shelter is empty day after day, week after week, you know, now they don't need them anymore, you know? Um, and there's a lot of, of other characteristics that contribute to that, that you can go listen to it on that show if you want to hear it. But, um, but yeah, you know, for sure there, there's a, there's a part of that. And that, and that's the thing I think, you know, again, is that, that, you know, it's easy for the left, uh, or I won't say necessarily the left, but I mean, that's just what it is, is that, you know, the, the, the pro abortion crowd is, is the left, yeah, the anti-abortion crowd is the right. I mean, that that's unfortunately basically where it falls down. It is that both sides are 
I'd say by and large equally wildly emotional about it, you know, which, which you know, emo- when, when emotion runs high, logic runs low. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I'm just looking at it primarily from that standpoint is that, it, is that I think, you know, again, not to beat a dead horse, but I just think ultimately at the end of the day, like I, I think you got to let people do whatever the fuck they want, because I, I think, you know, the, the more you control people and what they do and how they do it, uh, I, I just, I don't like that aspect. I don't like being told what to do. Uh, there's an there's an element of overpopulation I think that exists that uh, that isn't helping, uh, you know, my mentality or perspective position towards uh, abortion. Also, I think there's already too fucking many people on the planet. Uh, I do. I mean, I think when you, you think about just like say back to 1987 when I was uh, in the prime of my childhood, is that uh, you know back then the population was about 240 million. You know, so we we've increased. I'd say with all the people who are here that are unaccounted for, there's at least 100 million more people, you know, than just when I was a kid. I mean, think about that for a second. Like, America is a good-sized country, uh, but 100 million fucking people more than than was back then. I mean, I remember taking road trips as a kid, and you'd be on a two-lane interstate, and there wouldn't be that much traffic. That that does not exist anywhere in this country ever anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you know, pick any fucking interstate, any time of day other than about 2 a.m. to 5 a.m., and there are fucking tons of, of vehicles on it. P- I mean, pick any fucking town. Like, there, there's people every fucking where, you know. And so for me, it, it's hard to to argue for for the to us to have more of them, you know, when I'm already like, there's too fucking many of you to begin with. Hey, I can understand that's a very Bill Burr argument of you. He's yeah. he's willing to just sink cruise ships and, you know, take out a yeah. few thousand I, people at a time. I'm, I'm but, not quite at that point, but... <laughs> Uh, give me a few minutes, maybe give me a few beers and I might be, uh, I think we'll stop you before you yeah. get there because I mean, that may be more cancelable than the Zer no, I, I mean, I, you used earlier. Yeah. No, I mean, I don't, I don't give a shit about any of that stuff, but, uh, I, you know, to me, again, I just, it, it's all kind of inter, interconnected that way. And that, uh, I, I think you got to just leave people alone and, and let them do what they want to do. I, I get both sides of it, but I, I see an emotion running on both sides and that one doesn't, you know, is vehemently opposed to. Uh, you know, to being told what to do. The other side is vehemently opposed to, uh, to seeing, uh, you know, embryos all the way up to uh, about ready to be born uh, babies being terminated, right. which, you know, I, I think in, in both cases, there's a lot of emotion driving uh, a lot of that stuff. Well, the first, so I'm one of those people that believes at the moment, it's a, even a one celled zygote. It's not a human as <coughs> like you, you can't hold it. It's not a human, like you can't hold their hand and what help them across the street. They're just at a stage of development. They're a zygote and then they're a baby and then they're an infant and then they're a teenager and then they're an elderly, that type of thing. But in these types of hot button issues, and there may not be a, a more hot button issue than this one, the first one to lose their cool loses, yeah. right? And most of these people, there isn't an emotional appeal. And, and I've done podcasts where I, I have lost my cool talking about this issue, sitting in a studio, screaming into a microphone alone, right? Like I lose my cool. But when you're yeah. talking to somebody, and yeah. I've had some positive knockdown drag outs with people on this issue yeah. where we will each have whiskey and we will talk through these issues and like we come out not agreeing with one another, not fully understanding the other person's point of view, but with a better level of understanding yeah. and we can still shake hands, bro hug, and then leave because we both kept our cool the entire time. Yeah. We made our arguments because most people think emotion is a trump card. Like your level of rightness equals the level of your outrage. No, your yeah, level absolutely. of outrage. I think that's what, you know, Crenshaw was talking about in his, in his book Fortitude where he's talking about you're freaking out and you think that means you're right. Mm. And you think that means I'm not allowed to ask questions, right? And then when I ask a question, you get louder and more bratty and, and more off the deep end, just in a different direction. And so, again, the reminder that I would give to people is when you wade into these hot button issues, abortion, immigration, for, may, for you, it might be taxation. It might be foreign policy or foreign aid. Keep your cool. Because yeah. when you keep your cool, you will more so lean on your logical arguments, yeah, on the arguments sure. that you can write down on paper and say, this is why I feel like I'm right. Please yeah. tell me why I'm wrong. If yeah. you can't, I win. Yeah. No, and, and uh, you know, I, I respect uh, each side's opinion on it, too. I, you know, I guess ultimately I, I fall on, on the side of, of thinking it, it, it should be legal. Uh, you know, that's just how I feel about it. But, um, you know, and again, I, we can certainly agree to disagree. I, I mean, I'm not certainly not upset about it. And I think that that's where on both sides they get it wrong is they get fucking pissed. Just, yep. just like you were just talking about. And, and then it resorts to personal attacks and then, you know, and it's just like, well, you're not doing yourself any favors by, you know, by being an asshole about it, you know, but, uh, sure. anyway. yeah. Cause that's one thing is like, you, you kind of mentioned it that way. Like before, before you move on, like 
When's the last time you were addicted to somebody and you changed their mind about yeah, whatever no, you were yeah. arguing about? Well, it's the, yeah, it's the honey versus vinegar thing, right? Right. Well, yeah. and it's like even online, like you've spent the afternoon. You weren't working. You were crafting this response yeah. no, to I what somebody put on Facebook. Yeah. How often does somebody respond to your response and say, you know what? You make a great and valid point as yeah. I imagine you screaming at me through your yeah. keyboard. I well, have shifted my whole worldview now. Thank you. Yeah. Well, never. And, and I'll take it a step further. And I will say, you know, social media or online isn't the place to uh, to digest or argue or, or debate those topics anyway, nope. because that doesn't happen even if you're polite. Nope. You know, so I, I mean, I, I learned that years ago and, and, and I just don't do it. You know, I mean, there's Certainly, you know, I'll post a video of, of doing something with a dog or, or, I mean, fucking pick something. Somebody will have some, some smart ass shit to say. Yeah. Uh, and I just, I just don't even engage them because it's, it is pointless. You know what I always ask those people, Mike? Mm -hmm. I say, and I've had this come up, th this came up even with family members, uh, in the state of Oklahoma, the teachers like went out on strike and that's when I lost all romantic feelings towards teachers because a lot of them, it's like, you know, they're this homogenous group of heroes, supposedly, even though most of their classrooms aren't up to the level that they're supposed to be at. But yeah, yeah we're just supposed to worship them and pay them all a whole bunch of money. But <clears throat> like people would disagree with my points of view, which I don't really put online, you know, in, in text form anymore. And I say, that's an interesting perspective. How about we go out and have some drinks, either coffee or whiskey I'm buying and let's talk through it. Do you know how many of those people have followed through to actually zero. come? Zero. Zero. Yeah. None of those people, regardless of the topic, regardless of the issue, have said, you know what? I would love that. I would welcome that. Let's have that political discourse. I did have one person on the abortion issue. She about as vehemently disagrees with me as, as, as you could possibly be, very, very much so on the left. And she ghosted me for, for our coffee where we were going to discuss this, like learned adults, right? Yeah. But most of the people, they just want to feel like they're right. Yeah. They don't want to figure out if they're right. Yeah. And the only way they can figure it out, like I mentioned earlier, is breaking your philosophy on the rocks of somebody else's philosophy to see if anything's left standing. Yeah. Well, and, and I think even even uh, or you know on on top of that is that they they don't want to have to defend their position as to whether or not they're right. You know, and that's you know again you see it uh, i think uh, most people on the right are far better at at that because they have to be because there 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 aren't many media outlets that uh you know that that push that uh, that angle of most things you know even fox news you know uh, if you use say breitbart or uh, the daily wire you know some of those are are more uh, right leaning for sure but they're offshoot um, almost fringe uh you know, organizations by comparison to ABC News or, you know, CNN, MSNBC, whatever. So there's just such a an overwhelming uh, disparity between, um, you know, media channels, brands, and, and you know, the, the angles that they push that so few of them ever have to actually defend any of their positions that they're fucking terrible at doing it. But uh, at any rate, um, if you could just kind of talk about, um, you know, what – what, what you want to bring uh, via what you do in your podcast and your speeches and, and, and tie it into kind of what, what you think is the, whether the single biggest thing or the biggest things missing in America. So with what we're doing, I, I think there's a few ways to tackle that. I think there's an epidemic of effeminate men inside the church, of doughy, soft men inside the church. And I want to do my part in correcting that, right? So, so that's one part, right? So Hey guys, I'm going to convince you to cultivate spiritual, mental, and physical resilience <clears throat> on a daily basis to embrace the grind, embrace the suck, however you want to say it. Hey, we're going to get cold, wet, and sandy for God, like however you want to say it, right? Yeah. So that's one part of it. The other part is I want churches to be more man-friendly, right? I want churches to spend more time thinking about and preaching towards the Lion of Judah to help bring, you know, swing the pendulum back the other direction a little bit. I want the pastors and the worship leaders to think about their songs and think about the men that were going to potentially be singing them. Part of the reason why people like me don't go to a worship service. There's not and enough guns and roses. Modern, well, and it's like, well, first of all, you don't have that musicianship. It's not, you know, slash up there. It's just some dude that's doing his best. Right. And I'm not going to fault that guy for not being slash, but the musical content, the lyrical content, is very effeminate to where if you deadpan just read it, and I had a podcast where I read it. The podcast was called Contemporary Worship Music is for Women and Effeminate Men. I read the lyrics to a popular modern worship song, and I had some, you know, romantic music in the background and all that, and it's like, what did that sound like? 
Did that sound like a poem? Did that sound like Shakespeare? And, you know, if you switch out the name of Jesus and put in Bob or Larry, it sounds like you're singing a song to your boyfriend. So I want pastors and I want, you know, worship leaders, I want them to think of the men in their church because there is an epidemic of men leaving the church or men allowing the wife and the kids to go to church on their own. They're not leading their households in a biblical way. So on the church side of things, that's where I would say to push. We need more sheepdog minded people, more rugged Christianity. Like, you know, Taya Kyle said that she's like, I think of you guys and I think of rugged Christians. So it's like, we need more of that. But also I want churches to be more inviting to men because when you cater to a man in that way, everything, everything falls in line beyond that, right? When you walk into a household where there's a strong Christ centered man there strong in every way that you think strong, whether that's societally or biblically, whatever, a strong man, those women inside that household, the wives and daughters, they're not oppressed. You have provided for their flourishing. Those sons are under the, you know, the boot hill of an authoritarian leader. No, they're, they're ready. They're, they're, they're coming up and they're ready to, to live in a way that's going to be honoring to the women around them and to the young people around them. So that's that side. But on the other side of it, is people that tend to be on the right, which are people that tend to listen to my show, for them to realize that there are good arguments against these horrible, stupid worldviews, right? And to be so bold as to say that if you're a Christian and you vote for Joe Biden, that's that doesn't square with your worldview. You're voting for somebody that's okay with killing babies that you think have the Imago Dei, the, the image of God written onto them, right? And it's okay because most people aren't willing to go to that part of, oh, you shouldn't vote for these people, you know, do all that. No, no, no. I want to give people the arguments and the reasons to vote for a certain party, even though I have my major issues with the Republican Party and with the Libertarian Party. But those would kind of be the three areas. You know, let's get some tougher men inside these churches. Enough of the pussies in the pews. We need more sheepdogs. Also, these churches, there needs to be a reckoning and there needs to be a lot more manlyhood or manliness focus. And then also, if you're on the right and you're, you think like me conservatively with some libertarian tendencies, you got to be able to push back on these ideologies and you need the right people that are putting the right things in your ear and not just tickling your ears to make you feel good. Yeah. Do you, do you have... Uh, followers, listeners, any any type of customer slash fan base that are are not Christian? Absolutely, um, it's impossible to get that through through the data that you get from Apple or Spotify or, or wherever. Uh, you don't really get like a worldview designation, but I get that in my responses. Mm-hmm. I get that in my emails and my comments from people. Yeah, I love when a comment starts out with "I'm not a Christian, but." Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a conservative, but zip, you know, whatever the next thing is, right? Or even one of my other favorites is, I don't always agree with what you say and how you say it, but, yeah. and you kind of you go through from there. Because I feel like if I'm only talking to Christians, according to what I just told you, that's my audience, yeah. right? But one of the reasons why I was excited to kind of talk to your audience is because one of the reasons that I started Undaunted is because I know that there are men out there that are rougher around the edges, maybe former or active duty military, cops, construction workers, MMA fighters, jujitsu fighters that are going to walk into a church and they're going to survey the landscape and see all these dough boys and think, these aren't my people. Now I tell it out of there, right? Mm-hmm. And you would be hard pressed to say that they did the wrong thing. And from my perspective, and people would you know, maybe theologically disagree with me, I'm afraid that they're going to miss out on who Jesus is because they look at his followers and go, nah, nah, I'm not into it. You ever watch the show Vikings? Yeah, absolutely. So, so to me, what you're describing is, is how Christians are depicted in, in, in sure. most of those episodes yep. where like, wh- whether it's the, the leadership of the church or, or any of the members sitting in there. Yeah. Like they're just these soft, defenseless, total fucking pussies about right. everything. And they just get steamrolled by these fucking heathens, you know? Right. But I, I agree. I mean, I've I've been to a number of churches, not not in a while, but uh, but yeah. I mean, there there's almost a stereotypical American Christian male that that you're yep. just like, dude, that's fucking pathetic. The typical church guy, right? Yeah. And it's like, so these men purport to be Christ-like, right? They check the Christ-like boxes, right? And so you're making a decision, technically, whether or not you're going to opt into Christ-likeness, Christ-likeness or not, right? But then you see what. Christ likeness means yeah. and the dichotomy in your brain is like what? there's not enough sons of anarchy yeah. in here you know like there's yeah. there's not enough rough and tumble and again you can swing the pendulum too far the other way but in the pussies and pews episodes i talk about how there are two main periods that i feel like 
maybe damned the church in a lot of ways in terms of the fem- effeminate, you know, masculine side of things. And it was the Industrial Revolution and the World Wars. Because when the Industrial Revolution hit, the able-bodied, virile, testosterone-filled men were in factories or underground working these horrible hours. They weren't necessarily involved in the church. Then World War I, World War II, same thing, virile, testosterone-filled dudes. They're either fighting on some godforsaken beach and getting blown up or getting shell-shocked. And then whenever they come home, you know, maybe they're not the same guy that they were. So if you're in the pastorate, right, if you're a preacher or a priest or something like that, these people, and I'm painting with a broad brush here, so don't send me the hate mail, they tend to be a little bit more right brain, maybe a little bit more artistic, uh, maybe a little bit softer in their countenance. Like, those are things that are fairly typical that I don't think anybody would really disagree with broad stroke, right? But when you're looking out on your flock and you see females, and the only males you see are the young, the sick, and the old, and the weak, well, it would make sense that you're going to talk more about the Lamb of God as opposed to the Lion of Judah. Lion of Judah is scary, right? What do you do with the guy that turns over tables violently, right? What do you do with that guy? Double leg drop. Yeah, yeah, you, that, that would be the answer in my setup. But again, you know, if Jesus put, punched in here right now, I don't know that I'd hit him with a double leg. But then at the same time, why wouldn't the music become more effeminate? Why wouldn't the decorations become more effeminate? Why wouldn't you spend more time focusing? It's a marketing issue, right? If your audience is majority female, market to your audience, baby. Like, I understand why a pastor would do those things. I don't think it's a nefarious thing. I think it's just something that happened over time. It's like a very, very slow moving tide towards somebody, right? It didn't splash and take them out immediately. And so for a lot of these people, like it's the guys like you, it's the guys that are listening to this episode right now. It's the guys like me that at some point along the lines, they had to reckon with what they feel like a man is outside of the caricature, right? The beard, the four wheel drive, the chasing women, the cheap beer outside of the caricature. They had to reckon with what is a man. And if you can't square that with what a godly man is, it'll never connect unless there's some sort of, you know, otherworldly or otherwise intercession into that moment. Those are the guys I'm here for. So when I'm invited to come on a Christian podcast, I love it. I love talking to those guys. I want to encourage them. But especially when I come on a show where the person doesn't purport to have that same worldview and a lot of the listenership has some of the same questions that you have, like, I don't know if I can believe in a God that would allow this, or I don't know if I can believe in a this or a that, or that doesn't really square with my worldview here or there. Those are almost my audiences I enjoy being in front of the most because they're questioning, they're honest about it. And I feel like I can throw some things. I'm putting a pebble in their shoe. I'm putting a pebble in your shoe. When you think about the abortion issue now, you're thinking about 99% of those abortions happening for the reason of convenience. I have not shifted your entire worldview because I pounded my hand on the table. You are going to have to reckon with that pebble now. You're either going to remove it and flick it off and be done with it, or you're going to chew on it a little bit more, right? The pebble is going to get bigger. It's going to gnaw at you. It's going to nag at you. And those are the types of things. Those are the audiences I love talking to because there's a lot of them in these arguments, and there could be a lot of them in the church. And if we get that, we're going to see a revolution. Yeah. Are, are any of the, uh, uh, I guess, presentations, speeches, podcasts, are, are, are any of the things that you put out not based in Christianity? Are they, are they, do they all have some element of that woven into them? I think that it's impossible for, for someone like me to even not accidentally weave that into what's going on. But I can talk about physical resilience without proving to you in the Bible that you need it, yeah. right? Right. Um, if, if I'm going back to that, to my, my speeches I do on the pro-life issue, um, it would be very easy for me, I wouldn't, but it would be very easy for me to delete any scriptural references and make the same impact, right? Because again, if you don't believe the Bible's real, I can't make an appeal to the Bible as to why we can't kill that baby, right? Yeah. I'm going to yeah. focus more on logic, focus more on science. So there are a lot of those things. And I've been asked to kind of speak before military groups and all that. And even if you have a chaplain, you have to kind of be really careful, especially now with some of the crap that uh, that's happening under the uh, the new Joint Chiefs and uh, under the new president. That's terrible. Um, you know, co-president, mind you. Sorry, he's not actually the president. He's yeah. only half there. But uh, there are a lot of things that I do that can appeal to that audience. But it's kind of one of those things that, I know prominent pastors that they'll go speak at a business conference and they won't list their job title as lead pastor of said church. It'll be like business podcaster or influencer. It's like, bro, be who you are. That's your profession. That's your job. If you're introducing yourself to someone on a plane, don't shirk away and and kind of go away from that. And to me, I would say like, if you're ashamed of what you do for a living, you ought to switch fucking professions. Yeah. Now it's different now. If you're like, Hey, uh, yeah, I, I worked with the military and I was based out of the West coast. 
right? Or I was based out of the East Coast, right? That's different than saying, yeah, I got through, you know, green team screening. I'm on the development group, right? I'm on CL Team 6. Like, there are ways to say it where you can kind of be coy. You don't really want to invite that type of attention, but not in this scenario. So, So for me, it's like, people ask me, like, is your podcast a Christian podcast? And I say, well, it's a podcast by a Christian who's concerned about manhood, who's which is consumed by a lot of Christians and non-Christians that are interested in manhood and culture, right? It's a convoluted way of saying yes and no, right? Yeah. And so whenever I present in front of groups or whenever I do a podcast, one of my things that I constantly think about is I think about hooks in the water. Because if you're listening to me live, you're hearing about 60% of what I'm saying, you're internalizing about 10% and you'll remember about 1%, right? That's just kind of how it goes. I'm just throwing hooks in the water. So if you attach yourself to some of my more secular-based arguments... That's your hook. Yeah. If, I, if I attach you in some way to some of my more biblically-based, gospel-centered, Christ-centered arguments, then it is what it is. But there's a hook there, and I want to see change. Yeah. So like this, this Christian, overtly Christian group that I went and spoke to over the weekend, I told them from the beginning, I said, I get to leave. You have to stay. I'm not going to hold your hand through the process of changing in the ways that I'm telling you to change. Mm-hmm. I just have to trust that I left enough hooks long enough for you to make those necessary changes in worldview or in, you know, the style of how you do things. But ultimately it's not up to me. It's up to you. So if you got something from what I said, great. If not, you know, I guess I wasted my time. Yeah. What can I do? Yeah. No, I, I think it's a good, good way to look at it for sure. Um, do you, uh, do you ever speak or have you ever spoken to groups that weren't Christian based? Uh, n- not overtly at this point. And again, it's still a lot of this, Mike, it's still kind of new because yeah. it's like, undaunted life was kind of this side thing for a long time to where it's like, ah, you know, it's kind of cathartic to go into my studio once a week and scream at the mic about something I'm passionate about. And, oh, look, people are passionate about the same thing. Yeah. Now it's like, no, 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 this is like, call it my calling, call it whatever. Like, this is the direction I'm going until I can't go that direction anymore. And so I would absolutely embrace opportunities from more secular-based groups to talk about these things because, Again, I don't have to make biblically-based arguments. I would, but I don't have to make biblically-based arguments as to why critical race theory is junk, right? And there are things that I can appeal to that are appealing to a large audience. But again, if you, if you have the light of the world, you don't hide it under a basket like you, you show it off. And you can do that. And I've done this long enough to where I realize when that is willing to be reciprocated or willing to be embraced and where it's going to maybe not be right for that exact moment. Right. And yeah. so that, that's just kind of where I would approach that. Yeah. No, I, I think it's fascinating. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to come here and, and I've enjoyed uh, our, our discussions on it. I think, you know, for me that one of the biggest reasons uh, that I, I only do in-person interviews is, is because of that is especially if you, you know, have somebody on that maybe you disagree, even, even if it's only partially, um, you know, doing it on Skype or over the phone or, or whatever. It's just, just, it's just not the same, you know? Yeah. So uh, I appreciate you coming on here and, uh, and putting up with my fucking questions. Uh, where, uh, where can people find you? And, and, uh, and I guess before we even get into that, is there anything else that you want to talk about or, or say? No, that's all great. I feel like we covered a lot of topics. And so at this point, if you haven't gotten a sense of who I am and yeah. who you are in this conversation, it, you're yeah. kind of lost to us. But everything we do is through our website. So you just go to undaunted.life. That's our website, okay. www.undaunted.life. And I'm sure you'll, you'll put that in the show notes. But guys, yeah. anywhere you get podcasts like that, that's where we are. So we're on Apple, yeah. we're on Google, we're on Spotify, we're in all those places. Um, and through our website, you can get to socials and different things like that. We're most we're most uh, into Instagram and that's where we put most of our stuff. So if you send us a tweet, we're probably not going to see it kind of a deal, yeah. but yeah, if you want to book me to come and speak on, on a podcast or live at an event, that's where we do it. And every time we release something new, that's kind of where it is. And uh, there've been a lot of people that have been talking about me potentially kind of getting a book out there to kind of encapsulate some of these philosophies. So for the people yeah. asking, we're thinking about it. We're trying yeah. to figure out what that could possibly look like. I know yeah. the publishing world is, as you know, is a little bit, it's yeah. a little bit crazy to traverse and figure out what, what you want to do. But uh, no, I, I really, really appreciate this opportunity because, yeah. you know, the way that we were introduced, I was kind of, you know, pitched to you as like, hey, here's kind of a regular dude yeah. that leads kind of an irregular life. Like, I can't be like, oh, yeah, back when I was on SEAL Team 1 or, oh, yeah, you know, back <laughs> in Nam, like, I can't be that guy. Yeah. And I would never try to be. There's some guys in this, this space, Mike, that 
there was one dude in particular that I'll leave nameless because it doesn't matter, but he was in the Navy. Mm -hmm. He was never a Navy SEAL, and he would be introduced at speeches as a Navy SEAL, and he wouldn't correct the record. Yeah. And then he bristled at the fact that later on someone called him almost like a stolen valor thing. It's like, dude, that's not who I am. I've been introduced as an MMA fighter before, and I immediately go, by the way, I'm a blue belt in jiu-jitsu, and I've yeah. never fought in a cage professionally or otherwise, but... Yeah. You know, I just kind of em embrace where I am and kind of where I land on things. And yeah. if you like what we do, you do. If not, whatever. Yeah. No, I dig it. Um, well, again, I appreciate you taking the time, uh, especially, you know, getting in the bite suit. I know, you know, there are you know, a number of people who are like, oh, I'd love to do that. Uh, very few of them actually follow through. And, and most people are like, fuck, no, I don't want a dog to bite me, you know. So, uh, so kudos and hats off to you on that. Uh, again, appreciate you coming down, and uh, I'd like to take a quick second uh, to shout out and thank our sponsor for today's podcast, Origin Labs and Jocko Fuel. Jocko Fuel is a great product. Uh, he's got a ton of products, actually, within the Jocko Fuel line. Uh, the guests and I enjoy them on the show, and outside, I take a lot of the supplements. Uh, I've got some of the Origin Lab jeans, uh, boots, geese, and uh, it's just an all-around American industry. Uh, they do a fantastic job really re-revolutionizing American industry from start to finish. It's all American made, uh, all American sourced. Everything start to finish is made right there in-house. And they really do a phenomenal job creating the products and fulfilling the whole ball of wax. They've been a huge supporter of the Mic Drop podcast for a while now. And I really can't thank Jocko Fuel and Origin Labs enough for the job that they do for us. And so thank you to you guys. I'd also like to talk about uh, my brand of dog food that just came out. There's uh, food, treats, uh, a line of supplements. The supplements are hip and joint, digestive, skin and coat. Uh, the treats, there's salmon bites, beef bites, turkey bites, uh, salmon skins. And then the food, we've got a, a chicken and sweet potato formula as well as a salmon and herring meal formula. All of these products I, I've come out with uh, in the last six months after years of of trying to find uh, kind of the right blend and, and be uncompromising in the product quality of what I want uh, and was uh, fortunate enough to work with a manufacturer that made everything exactly how I wanted it, uh, tested it out and got it dialed into exactly how I want it. And now we've brought it to market and, uh, and it's available to you guys. So MikeRitlandCo.com, it's the Fueled by Team Dog line of, of food treats and supplements. I encourage you to either check it out or choke yourself. To the listeners, uh, this is the new studio. This is uh, an interim part of the new studio. It is going to change a little more here as we get settled in. Uh, that's why I've, I've been off the grid for the last uh, almost two months now with no episodes, but uh, we are back. We've got several several other uh, shows booked uh, for this month and, and subsequent months. So we are back, and uh, we'll start doing more and more episodes here. But uh, I appreciate your patience. Uh, as always, I appreciate your uh, steadfast support and, and continuation uh, to keep listening in uh, show after show because if, if you didn't, I wouldn't do this. So I appreciate it. Uh, we'll see you soon. And until next time, this is Mike Drop.